Hello everyone, I'm here to talk to you about a vision of artificial intelligence that goes beyond machines and algorithms. A vision which embraces humans and nature as integral parts of a cyber-physical ecosystem of intelligence. A vision that is based on first principles derived from physics and biology. Professor Carl Friston just dropped a paper called Designing Ecosystems of Intelligence from First Principles. And one of the principles is active inference, a formulation of adaptive behavior which can be read as a physics of intelligence. Active inference says that intelligent systems are those which can accumulate evidence for a generative model of their sensed world. In other words, they can learn from their observations and update their beliefs accordingly. They can also act on their environment to reduce uncertainty and achieve their goals. But active inference is not about individual agents. It also explains how ensembles of agents can share beliefs and cooperate through communication protocols. This leads to a formal account of collective intelligence that rests on shared narratives and goals. So how do we realize this vision? Friston proposes a research agenda for the next decade and beyond, which aims to design such ecosystems of intelligence from scratch. They suggest developing a shared hyperspatial modeling language and transaction protocols, as well as novel methods for measuring and optimizing collective intelligence. So why should we care about this vision? It's because it offers a way to harness the power of artificial intelligence for the common good without compromising human dignity or autonomy and because it challenges us to rethink our relationship with technology, nature and each other, and because it invites us to join in a global community of sense makers who are curious about the world and eager to improve it. Enjoy the show. Our shared human journey is filled with examples of simple ideas that were nonetheless hard to discover and some that even once explained remain hard to comprehend. Their subtle simplicity belies their far-reaching and deep consequences. Examples might include the principle of relativity, quantum mechanics, the principle of parsimony, and entropy. I think the free energy principle is another example. Profound and far-reaching, yet belied by its simplicity, it has, on the one hand, been dismissed as a triviality or even a tautology, and on the other, hailed as revolutionary and everything in between. It has the potential to reshape how we view the connection between inanimate matter and living things, and even to answer the question of how and why consciousness and intelligence might emerge from physical matter and processes. That means a world where all things, from particles to people to the largest systems, all move or evolve according to two processes which combine. The first is a smooth-flowing evolution. Think of planets orbiting a star or waves rippling over water or through quantum fields. The second is a random process that knocks around the smooth flow in unpredictable ways. Think of twinkling stars or audio static. You might think of these two processes as a kind of order and chaos, or yin and yang, forever intertwined and enmeshed. These two very different effects combine into a chaotic flow which may be entangled in a kind of tropical storm while still maintaining a semblance of structure and things. Think about raindrops undulating down to earth in a state of constant flux, yet still droplets, or a human being growing and adapting to the surprises of life, all the while remaining an individual, physical entity. Biology often asks the question, what must things do in order to exist? 
Professor Friston has turned that question on its head and developed perhaps the ultimate existential formalism. He asks, if things exist, what must they do? From the foundation of stochastic differential equations, Friston demonstrates that things, which are defined by a Markov blanket, must always move towards a pullback attractor, a special set of attracting states which maintains the integrity of the Markov blanket and therefore a thing's coherence and identity over time. One of the profound consequences of this is that the dynamics of such a system, its laws of motion, will manifest a form of flow dynamics which can be interpreted as Bayesian active inference. In other words, such a thing maintains an internal equivalent of a generative model encoding beliefs about the world and itself. The thing uses the model to decide actions and then performs a Bayesian update based on the outcomes. For me, the idea that inference, something widely perceived as purely abstract or mathematical, the idea that it can be driven by simple laws of motion, dynamically maintaining the boundaries between things, maintaining order in the face of chaos, is frankly astonishing. What's more, the free energy principle is so general that it applies at all scales of size and time, leading to an ecosystem of things interacting across scales. Perhaps in that multi-scale act of inference, we might finally find the keys to a mathematics of emergence and consciousness. This episode is sponsored by Numerai. Um, I'm extremely grateful to them for sponsoring Machine Learning Street Talk. I mean, remember, I do everything myself on this channel. It's a lot of time, it's a lot of hard work. It's very expensive. I pay for all the software licenses and, and all of the equipment. So um, yeah, having that support from Numerai means a lot to me and it means that I can keep doing what I'm doing, basically. So thank you to Numerai. So a little bit about Numerai, they are a data science competition platform to predict the stock market. They've already paid out over $50 million uh, for 5,000 models on their platform. And they say that it's the highest paying data science platform in the world. Now you can get started really easily for free and they've got a couple of examples on their GitHub repo actually using XGBoost. Um, and the data comes in parquet format so you can get up and running really easily. You can submit your predictions weekly or daily. You can do it either manually or you can do it automatically. And um, they provide many, many years of, of back testing data as well. So you can fine tune and test your models and do a bunch of statistical diagnostics. You can work your way up the leaderboard um, for bragging rights and stake your model with their NMR cryptocurrency to earn rewards. Now, staking is a vote of confidence of your model, and the reason they do that is to prevent overfitting and to reduce the um, you know bad models from kind of contributing bad intelligence to their to their aggregate. Now, a well-performing model is rewarded in proportion to its stake, but a poorly performing model is um, punished by burning a portion of the stake. Now, Numerai have a huge community of data scientists of all levels swapping ideas and advice. And um, they have uh, some community forums as well, which you should join. Now, um, just a personal note from me. This is a form of betting on the predicted performance of your models, which can go up or down. Remember, the data is abstracted from the actual performance of the stocks. They, they don't correlate to actual stock performance. So there are folks on the platform who've made lots of money, but there's also folks who have lost money as well. So please be responsible and only stake what you can afford to lose and have confidence in. Try to have fun, use it as a place to sharpen up your data science skills and to be the best version of yourself and use all of the latest models that we've been talking about here on, on Street Talk. But um, yeah, anyway, thank you again to Numerai for sponsoring us. Professor Friston, it's an absolute honor to meet you. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, so we've had you on the show two times now. And in the first show, we went into um, 
exquisite detail about the free energy principle and, and active inference. So um, you're extremely famous for introducing this existential imperative, which is to say, if things survive, what must they do? They gain information about the world around them in a cybernetic loop. We find a model which fits well while maintaining high entropy. If you have a higher entropy model, you have greater flexibility to adapt to new information. It's an absolutely beautiful idea. So um, welcome. Thank you. Uh, nicely articulated. Um, I was speaking with Keith yesterday and he said out of all of the guests that we've had on MLST, you are by far his favorite. And uh, he says he, he looks up to you very much. So he's, he's very gutted that he couldn't come uh, today to be part of this. Oh, that's very gracious of him. So um, you just wrote a paper and it's called Designing Ecosystems of Intelligence from First Principles. You led with this white paper lays out a vision of research and development in the field of artificial intelligence for the next decade and beyond. It's denouement, I wasn't sure if I was going to say that word, <laughs> is a, a cyber physical ecosystem of natural and synthetic sense making in which humans are integral participants, what we call shared intelligence. This vision is premised on active inference, the formulation of adaptive behavior that can be read as the physics of intelligence and which inherits from the physics of self-organization. So um, you went on, and by the way, there's an interesting link with Michael Levin's work here. So we had him on the show recently, oh, and brilliant. maybe even transhumanism as well, we, could, we can get into that. Um, but you went on, you said, in this context, we understand intelligence as the capacity to accumulate evidence for a generative model of one's sensed world, also known as self-evidencing over multiple scales. And crucially, you said active inference foregrounds an existential imperative of intelligent systems, namely curiosity or the resolution of uncertainty. And the same imperative underwrites belief sharing in ensembles of agents in which certain aspects, which is to say factors of each agent's uh, generative model, provide common ground or a frame of reference. So can you sketch some of this out for me? <laughs> Yes, you've used all my favourite words there. I presume that I actually used all the... Well, in fact, to be truthful, um, Maxwell Ramstead was, was one of the, the key architects of this. So this was a um, this white paper was a response to a brief just to think seriously and pragmatically how this sort of high church theoretical approach to you know, intelligence and self-organisation would play out in industry in the way that we actually use um, technology um, over the next decade. And that white paper is a product of our machinations and, and discussions. Um, but just drilling down on, on the sort of basic message there, um, the emphasis was, as you say, on um, what it is to exist and how that would manifest in terms of intelligent behavior. Um, and to a certain extent, certainly I, and I think a number of the other co-authors, were reading intelligence as the kind of inference that you would need to do in order to maintain your existence. So hence the existential imperative. I have to say that's a slightly um, poetic interpretation of the free energy principle, which is the other way around, <laughs> of course, that if you exist, it looks as if you are behaving intelligently if you read intelligence as the right kind of belief updating hmm. um, that enables you to maintain yourself in some characteristic state. So that's, that, that's essentially... Um, what that existential imperative was all about. You just uh, one way of reading the physics, the mechanics of systems that are open in open exchange with the rest of their world or their eco niche, um, simply in virtue of the fact that they are around for an extended period of period of time and have this characteristic set of states that they occupy that defines them as the kind of thing that they, they are. I think the move really that was inspired by this remit to look, okay, well, that's very nice. You can write lots of papers about that and have nice you know, chats with, with your friends and colleagues about it. Uh, but how does that actually work in practice? And of course, mm. in practice, you have to think about where you're going to deploy this um, perspective, deploy the, the kind of technology that would, you know, um, ensue from that uh, perspective and of course we're talking about communication we're talking about a universal world of lots of creatures like me and you so now we get to um, the next level of application of these existential imperatives in the context of not just intelligent behavior 
and uh, just open brackets behavior here is quite important you know um, often I hear um, underwriting the move from AI artificial intelligence to IA where it's uh, intelligent agents that have mm. artifacts with agency that do have behaviors that have a, a sentient kind of behavior and or at least an intelligent uh, kind of behavior close brackets um, so um, you, you, we're now moving from um, thinking about a single thing, a particle or a person um, or a computer, um, and thinking now about having lots of things that are talking to each other and they're coexisting. So now we're in the world of distributed intelligence, mm. distributed cognition. Um, and one thing which um, you, know, you mentioned explicitly, this notion of belief sharing. So now we're in a different kind of world where we're thinking, okay, we think we understand the imperatives for good behavior, um, the necessary kinds of behaviors that, you know, you, you, I think you highlighted curiosity, I think is absolutely central in terms of, um, um, you know, hallmarking and characterizing the kinds of behaviors that you and I engage with or a truly intelligent or sentient behavior would entail. Um, but now the idea is, well, what would that look like? And um, when you've got lots of these things talking to each other, well, we know what it looks like. We, we talk to each other literally. So it's all about language. It's all about uh, belief sharing, shared intelligence. Um, distributed cognition would be one thing that you might find in the, in the life sciences. Um, if you were a computer scientist, it's all about sort of the right kind of message passing on very, very large factor graphs. Um, if you're um, if you're a linguist or uh, um, uh, into uh, evolutionary psychology, it's all about ne cultural niche construction, the emergence of language. Mm -hmm. So I found that quite fascinating as something which you know you really had to get on top of to think, well, what next, and what kind of technologies would you need to realise, and what would they look like? Um, um, you know, one way that's been framed to me by my new friends now in industry um, is you know what would what's it going to look like what what is um, AI or now IA going to look like um, in the future taking the kind of perspective you know over the decades or indeed centuries where you're moving from sort of the industrial age to the age of information and I think the notion now is we're now coming to the end of the age of information and now we're in the age of intelligence and, and thinking about what, what that might look like and how would, would one equip people with the right kind of technology and infrastructure um, to, you know, to realize the potential of shared intelligence, essentially. Yeah, that's very interesting. So we spoke with Luciano Floridi at Oxford and he's invented this philosophy of information. He talks about the infosphere and how we're, we're out we now have third order technology essentially. So things like Amazon and Facebook. And he talks about the um, diminishment of our ontology and agency in the infosphere. And using this information as a substrate thing, I think is very interesting because that's kind of alluding to, to what you're going to. But um, you said something actually in your paper, which gave me pause for thought. You said uh, the AI age may end up being a distributed network of intelligent systems which interact frictionally in, uh, friction, uh, frictionlessly in real time and compose into emergent forms of intelligence at subordinate scales, as you were just alluding to. And the nodes of such a distributed interconnected ecosystem may then be human users as well as human designed artifacts that embody or implement forms of intelligence. Now, this really did make me wonder because I think we're already there now. And uh, so when, when we had uh, Floridi on, he was talking about how our digital identity has already distributed. We were consumers and then we became barcodes. And now there's this kind of infinite fractionation in the infosphere. And it's almost as if humanity isn't the, the substrate anymore. Information is the substrate. And he said, you can devalue human skills. You can remove, uh, remove human responsibility. You can reduce human control. You can erode human self-determination. But the rock that thought that little drop of water was nothing. 18 years later has a hole in it because drop after drop after drop, the drop will shape the stone, will shape the rock. And I think what he meant by that is being ensconced and enmeshed in technology to such a high degree and information being the first class citizen in our society is kind of truncating our very existence. I mean, what would you say to that? 
beautifully, beautifully expressed, very poetic. Uh, I'd have to think about that very carefully. Uh, I'm sure there are deep truths there. Um, and certainly from uh, from the point of view of a physicist, your know, information is obviously um, the thing. It is, it is uh, in many respects, the, you know, the substance of our universe and our existence. And, you know, also acknowledging that energy is information and mm. energy is just a potential and so we're all about we're all in the game of realizing potentials in a sort of folk psychology sense but also literally in terms of minimizing certain potentials for example self-information uh, would be the the free energy potential that you're that you're minimizing the surprise uh, mm. again coming back to this sort of making you know, belief sharing in the service of minimizing uh, minimizing a surprise and realizing our, our our potential um so i but i don't see that as a, as a negative thing i think that's just an acknowledgement that you know at the end of the day um the way that we model and articulate and talk about um ourselves our lived world whether we're a quantum physicist a um a statistical um, um uh, physicist or a, a classical uh, physicist or or have an interest in our, in the equivalent mechanics at each of those levels. It's all about information. It's all about the probability of being in this particular state. You just take the um, the negative log of that. That is the self information of this particular state. So it's all a, you know. If you look at quantum physics, you know, what, what else is there? It, it boils down to um, in its sort of most elemental and scale free or background free form, um, quantum information theory. Hmm. And so if you can reduce it to you know to quantum information theory, which many people, including friends of Mike Levin, uh, um, uh, think one can, then I think there's a, there's a deep truth that the, that we we are just um, uh, realizations of information, and particularly um, from my perspective, of course, we being a thing, what what kind of um, information um, processing would be apt to describe us that could be you know, articulate in terms of quantum information theory, it's belief updating. So we come back to the Bayesian mechanics that you can put on top of this underlying, um, you know, sort of information theoretic, probabilistic description of the world. Mm. Um, but I guess, I, I'm so reading between the lines and, and, and the twinkle in your eye, it, it, the idea that he's trying to get across is that may be quite bad for humanity. Is that is that the idea? Is it? Or? Well, that's what that's what he thinks. And I mean, he thinks. You're a computationalist. Uh, you, you, you think that information is, is the kind of primary sub substrate. And in a way, he's also worried that information is becoming the primary sub substrate. But the big difference between you and Floridi is that he thinks that humans are special. He thinks that we, like Kant, we have autonomy. We choose our own actions. You know, we, we can't be right. replicated in silico. So he thinks essentially that there's no such thing as general intelligence, that there, there's just algorithms that perform skills and it's our humanity which is being truncated. I see. Right. Okay. Well, I'm, I would be very sympathetic to that. Yes. I mean, we are special um, kinds of intelligence, um, and one could equip that argument with, you know, what is the definition of sentience? What's a bright line between, you know, a very clever um, thermostat um, or some uh, machine learning artifact um, or a virus? Uh, and you and me, uh, I, I think there is a bright line. And, and you, of course, you've just said what it is. It's, it's the autonomy, it's the agency, it's the ability to plan, and the, all the existential imperatives that um, that underwrite that planning. And then we come back to curiosity. So, but if he's saying that um, our um, the, the fact we are here belies the fact we are curious creatures, and because we are um, um, we populate a universe that comprises creatures like us, we're all curious about each other, then I would certainly say, yes, that is a definitive aspect of us, which is not found, I think, um, I'm, I'm just thinking carefully, because I'm sure you can find examples, but um, you know, I, I don't, in, in the kind of artificial intelligence that we currently interact with and exchange with, mm. you don't have that planning and curiosity, they don't have the, you don't have bait into the optimization um, framing of you know what makes a, a viable or a, a good bit of intelligence. You don't actually have baked in universally um, this expected information, came this curiosity, and in that sense, um, I think he's probably absolutely right. Um, 
and in a sense the belief sharing um, um, getting to that the right kind of belief sharing of the kind that the white paper was talking about is uh, predicated on the notion that you will now be able to equip sentient artifacts that we make with curiosity and you may be asking well what are they going to be curious about their world what is their world it's you and me and the other artifacts so they're only going to be curious about you and me they're going to be interested in you and me um, so we're talking about you know a, a, a Siri or a Google Maps that starts to ask you questions instead of you asking them questions. So that, that I think that's that's one way of eluding his his sort of rather dystopian <laughs> attitude to, to the the you know, the, the, the you know, information is king. I think information is king. Belief updating is king. The, you know, yeah. um, belief updating is you know um, of course the, the thing that. Um, ensues once you act upon the world to do some st smart data mining to you know to um, respond to some epistemic affordances um, and you know the question then is you know, you know what kinds of systems do that and at the moment I would argue it's probably just us I, there are other examples there's some beautiful examples in um, say active learning using machine mm. learning um, you know to design your own experiments and automize the actual experiments and say drug discovery or um, um, you know, molecular biology um, so I mean the, 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 the reason a long history both in statistics and in machine learning of active learning mm. um, that I think does have the potential but I don't see it really being um, um, well from what I understand in discussions, I don't see that being a bedrock of the way forward, an explicit part of the design for yeah. an, infam an in age of intelligence that is um, puts us sympathetically in an ecosystem of intelligence, um, and that's really what that white paper was trying to think. What, you know, what would it look like, to, um, and what would happen if your Google Maps became very curious about you, particularly. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Google Maps. I think is a, well. Th th there are two sort of um, sort of metaphors here, which are, which which might sort of um, ground the f you know, the, the frame um, the framework or the perspective that um, I'm trying to think about this this worry. Um, one which I found very helpful, um, again coming from um, my colleagues um, in, in, in industry, is. Just trying to explain the you know, the nature of shared intelligence mm -hmm. and distributed intelligence, um, and the the analogy here would be the brain. You know, you've got really smart little elements, little neurons. I mean, they're really smart. And in fact, if you, if you get into the weeds of dendritic computation, incredibly smart little things um, that are in receipt of their sensations, and they act by sort of pinging they don't know who they're pinging but they're pinging away sending out little action potential or messages down down the axons the, the wires that uh, in, are emitted from from the nerve cells and you've got you know uh, 10 billion of these things and they're all very very smart but would you call any one of them autonomous would they call would, would they have agency Ele in an elemental sense i think they do um, but it's when you put them all together lots and lots of little smart things together do you get this emergent kind of intelligence mm that you could undeniably say um, has the capacity to roll out into the future to you know, um, generate fantasies or um, counterfactuals that are all conditioned upon what I'm going to do next, where I now becomes this collective. So this is the kind of emergent um, uh, behavior that emerges from getting lots of little smart things to talk to each other in the right kind of way. So that that that's you know, I think quite a helpful analogy by what is meant between you know, about shared intelligence and, and what might you know might arise. Clearly, a lot of these little smart brain cells would be analogous to you and me. And a lot of other them, a lot of others would be all kinds of apps and you know, uh, you know giving you now the potential to see through the eyes of of uh, any smart app that knows what you want to know and is curious about what you want to you know. To find out again, com coming back to this notion that um, belief sharing, I think, is already there in the context of, say, you know, uh, sat nav. You know, I um, share my beliefs about my 
preferred states of being, my characteristic preferences are one part of the you know the imperatives for, for policy selection or the good plans. I share that with, in terms of a destination with some shared world model or shared narrative between me and my satnav. Um, you know, in this instance, a sort of a geographical world model, um, and then it has. Uh, beliefs about the best policy it makes a little plan um, mm-hmm. and then it shares its beliefs with me again uh, so I think that you know that to, to the extent that um, your colleague in Oxford was, was uh, saying we're already there I think that, that that's absolutely right I mean you know, we already have this kind of belief sharing um, I think that the move though is um, um, to make that a, a much more symmetric belief sharing you know, I'm asking the app for its beliefs, for its, I'm asking it to behave as a recommender, yeah. um, and, um, and it only knows what I tell it, so it has no autonomy. But if it was now in a position to actively, smartly resolve its uncertainty about me, the user, then it's much more of a sort of you know um, um, a balanced, symmetrical, dyadic interaction between me and the app. And the agenda here is not to create paper clips or make money. The agenda, remember, is just to resolve uncertainty, to sate curiosity, and to uh, move towards a state of greater mutual understanding. So that, 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 that's a sort of the, uh, the non-dystopian view of, of uh, you know, information sharing. So um, Shane Legg, said that his definition of intelligence is the ability of an agent, and we're using words here like agent, we'll get to those words in a minute, being able to solve a variety of tasks in different environments. Francois Cholet said it's efficiently creating abstractions given limited priors and experience. Pei Wang says it's the adaptation efficiency over finite resources. So um, when you look at definitions of intelligence, typically they focus on principle and function, which I think your one does or capability or behavior or structure. Now, um, the interesting thing about the principal one in particular is I think it's the least anthropomorphic. And I think yours is the least anthropomorphic definition I've ever heard of. So, um, and also this concept of um, grounding in the physicality of information rather than reality itself. And whether they are the same thing, of course, is a philosophical discussion that maybe we'll park for another time. Um, but. Yeah, how how would you contrast your definition of intelligence from these other ones? Um, well, I think you've already done that. You, you, you've just said it's you know it's it's a um, a minimal, um, essentially a, a physics based definition of intelligence, which requires you know a move or indeed a complete commitment to staying in the space of information and inf- information geometries and belief updating. Um, so. Um, Having said that, I think all of those definitions touch upon some essential aspects of intelligence. Every one of them rang true you know, to my ears. Um, and I could read every one of those as being one um, key uh, foundational aspect of what would emerge if any self-organizing system managed to supervene and coexist with other self-organizing systems um, from the point of view of, you know, of the free energy principle, um, the sort of um, first principle approach, so there are no axioms and no assumptions. Um, the question is not, um, you know, what is quintessentially anthropomorphic. Um, the question is what emergent properties of certain kinds of self-organizing systems would qualify as having that that biomimetic and then ultimately anthropomorphic aspects to them. Um, you don't even have to go to anthropomorphism. I mean, if you um, um, we're talking uh, you know, as you have been to Mike Levin and and his friends. You know, they would talk about basal cognition. They would talk about you know, uh, just a multicellular organism is a beautiful construction of uh, that rests upon autopoiesis, self assembly of individual cells, but also cells of cells. And you know, how does a, a surface cell, an epithelium, know that he's on the surface? And how does that uh, individuate the internal cells of an organelle or an organ? Um, from the rest of the environment, so the, you know the the, the kind of um, um, intelligence that has this anthropomorphic feel. I think people are are also seeing 
in biotic self-organization that would be a long way away from the kind of psycholo folk psychology intelligence that we're talking about. And yet it rests upon exactly the same kind of mechanics. And, you know, for me, that would be the Bayesian mechanics that come from the, you know, the dynamics of systems that are self-organizing, open systems that, that, that are self-organizing. Um, so, you know, you, you, know, you, you talked about so adaptation um, as being one aspect. One co common theme in the, in the um, the sequence of definitions you gave, I think, does speak to this bright line between uh, basal cognition and biotic self organization, bio biological intelligence of the kind you can read in many many different ways. Your your DNA, for example, your genotype, is an intelligent information. Uh, accumulating device from the point of view of evolu evolution you know it it stores all the information about what it would require to build a phenotype that's fit for purpose in this particular environment so you know that's a kind of belief updating that's a kind of intelligence but it doesn't have what we were talking about before which is this capacity to plan evolution doesn't plan um, you could also argue that the the world wide web doesn't plan um, Google Maps, you could argue, does plan to a certain extent because it's certainly... So what's the difference? Um, the difference is, I think, implicit in at least the first two of your of your uh, definitions, which is this notion of counterfactual futures, this notion of um, you know, imagining a future or, um, putting it another way, having a world model or a generative model um, that explains things that are not tied to the moment. So if you're a physicist, what you're talking about is now a probabilistic mechanics, a Bayesian mechanics, or possibly just you know, an information theoretic mechanics based upon paths through time. So we're talking about things like the pathological formulation. And, you know, um, but crucially, we're talking about trajectories that, don't, that, that cannot be localized to this point in time that necessarily entail the future and indeed the past. So I, you know, that notion of freeing yourself in a, uh, you know, the, I can't remember the name of the philosopher now. But I can remember the name. I just can't pronounce it, so I'm going to pretend I can't remember. <laughs> but there are people who there are um, there are you know, philosophical schools that, that, that emphasise this temporality aspect. Now, you know, and if you just look at physics, uh, look at contributions of Richard Feynman, for example, it, yeah, it's all about the pathological formulation, um, uh, and. Um, so I think as soon as you talk about um, the, the elements to which the information geometry is an intelligence and autonomy, um, all of these things could apply are not states. They are trajectories, dynamics, narratives, paths um, that have this, um, this sort of future pointing aspect. Um, then being able to select among different futures becomes an emergent property of this kind of sense-making, this kind of autopoiesis, under, you know, read as a Bayesian mechanics of self-organization. And just thinking about your definitions, they all have the aspect of choosing among different futures or uh, considering or having abstractions um, uh, you know, about what might happen if, if this. Uh, so for me, that that is one way of um, expressing curiosity because... To be curious, you have to imagine, well, what would happen if I did that? And what would I know if I did that? But you have to imagine it before it's actually happened, which, you know, is, is for me the big bright line between, um, you know, between the anthropomorphic kind of intelligence and the intelligence you find in a thermostat or in a, you know, a, 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 you know, a variation autoencoder. Yeah. Um, later on, we will decompose the different aspects of cognition and I think as well as thinking, it can be knowing and, and acting as well, and, and, we'll, and we'll, we'll talk to that. But you said words, you know, action, agent, percept, goal, plan, behavior, and I guess, and I, I pose this to Levin as well, it feels like these are terms that we understand, because we have cognitive priors like agentiveness and, and so on. These are things that, that we understand, but might actually only be a lens into something far more complicated. And just to touch on the um, information traversal point uh, over a geometry, that's very interesting. And I'm no expert, but I think the medial temporal lobe deals a lot with spatial contiguity, and we have grid and place cells, et cetera, et cetera. So it, you know, at, at a macroscopic level in our brain, it's a first-class citizen. 
but there's also this hierarchy, isn't there? Um, when does it start happening? You know, do, do single cell organisms plan into the future? And to the previous point, is planning necessarily a reductive lens of intelligence? Well, you brought up loads of interesting things there. You, you call me by the reductive lens. That's a lovely phrase. What does that? What does that mean? Well, um, I, I didn't. I didn't mean it in a pejorative sense. But when when we use words like you know, like we 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 say intelligence must do X, Y, and Z. It no. must plan. It must reason. It must act. And we have this cybernetic loop and so on. And I I have a theory that this is just the way we understand things. I see. And, and in a sense, it's a lens onto a much more complicated thing. And, and the reason this is interesting is the reason why we have people like John Searle, who says that the, um, the impenetrable realm of the subjective experience is beyond function dynamics and behavior. It's a little bit extra. And, and even um, morality is another example. We'll talk about that later. That feels like it's something which is a little bit extra. So there's always this question of to what extent is intelligent behavior deducible from the models and the words that we use? Yes, oh, I, I think that's a fundamental point. Uh, I, you said, um, okay, now I understand what a reductive lens is. I like that. I like, the, um, I like it for many reasons, of course, because, um, it, well, first of all, um, it certainly is not, uh, you, I don't think it could ever be used in a pejorative sense, um, but it does speak to um, two fundamental themes, which is... Um, the, the way that we do make sense of our world through coarse graining, through reducing, uh, through having um, intuitive models of the way that the world works, um, ultimately could be um, um, seen as language, words. Mm -hmm. um, could be, I think, could also be seen as, quite, to be quite honest, as physics and maths as well, to be quite honest. Um, you know, <laughs> these, these are, the more I read about, about, you know, modern mathematicians and physicists talking about that, you know, their skills and, and, and the, the legacies that they, that they enjoy, the more I, I realize it's all changing all the time. It's just another kind of reductionism, um, but language particularly, but it's a right kind of reductionism. And I guess what you're saying is that, you know, um, we have this um, way of summarizing and classifying certain kinds of behavior, which may not truly reflect the underlying mm. complexity, the beauty of what's going on underneath. That, at, that, at that point, I would go the other way. I would actually say that do not properly reflect the underlying simplicity of what's going on, to be quite honest. Uh, you know, uh, this comes back to, you know, the... Uh, unashamed use of phrases like sort of existential imperatives and self-evidencing yes. yeah yes. we're just here we're just we just have characteristic sets sets we're just uh, realizations of some glorious um langevin equations and all these stories about sort of uh belief updating and um sentience and intelligence are just reductive stories that make sense of you know what we what, you know what um uh, what we must, um, or can, if indeed, to a certain extent, the free energy principle itself, I think, is a reductive story of that kind. Mm. Uh, you know, mm. When I say, if you look at things through the lens of Bayesian mechanics, or as if, I think the free energy principle is another example of of this kind of reductive thing. It's uh, looking at something which is inherently much more simple than, than the lens through which you're looking at, which is the Bayesian mechanics and the free energy principle. <laughs> so I think that's absolutely right. A really interesting idea. Um, so, uh, uh, and uh, uh, at another level, I think it speaks to some key issues. You know, I mean, you're um, you, 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 you're often um, then confronted with, you know, okay, I'm talking with you about agency and agents and me and you uh so what license is that what aspects of my implicit world model or generative model endow me with the sense of me and you and indeed me as agent and you know what would that look like if i stripped away um different levels of meta awareness or meta uh, uh, cognition if you're a psychologist and, uh, and just had a minimal selfhood um, you know, is just be having plans um, sufficient to call me an agent, even if I don't know if I'm an agent. But yeah. if I have plans, who else is going to act? Uh, you know, enact those plans. Uh, I, mean, I, I would love to go there slightly later, but there's 
so much we can say about um, agency and the boundaries and also the causal pressures between agents and also whether you can think of boundaries as being observer relative. But I, I just really wanted to go to the universal um, algorithm thing that you spoke about before because I, I think it's delicious. So um, I think it's fair to call you a universalist. And, that, and that, that's, there, there are quite a few universalists, actually. They're, these are people who think there's a simple underlying principle. And, th and this is in contrast to what we were just talking about, which is that the, the reality is more complicated than, than we'll ever understand. And we have a truncated cognitive horizon. And we, as Chomsky says, we just have kind of um, simple primitives built into us that help us frame and, and, and understand a kind of abstraction space within a certain cone. But um, I was reading Professor Christopher Summerfield's book at Oxford. I interviewed him last week. And he said in his book, um, could it be that the um, success of mammalian brains is not due to any careful crafting into a mosaic of different functional subsystems, but instead is merely due to size? We know there's a powerful relationship between the sheer number of neurons and the complexity of behavior. He went on. Uh, he said, researchers and neuroscientists alike, such as Carl Friston, and uh, Jeff Hawkins and even Andrew Ng have flirted with the idea that there might be a single algorithm which underpins intelligence with the brain acting like a massive TPU, repeating instructions ad nauseum to generate complex behavior. So it's a fascinating idea. Is that a fair summation? Yes. Uh, what's a TPU in this? Oh, well, a tensor pro uh, programming unit. It's a Is very it? right. powerful um, computer. Right. Yeah. I've learned another new acronym. My <laughs> world is full of new acronyms. Right, okay. Um, yeah, um, so the, what, what, which, which, his argument there is it's something to do with um, scale and size. Is, is that what? Well, not, not, on, not only that, I mean, we'll, we'll get to, there's a guy called Rich Sutton, and he, he had oh, this, yeah. um, you know, bitter lesson essay, and it's a warning against handcrafting um structures, architectures, because it bottlenecks, it doesn't scale. So this universalist idea is that, you know, maybe, and, and Jeff Hawkins says the same thing. He, he's got this thousand brains theory of intelligence. Yes, yes. And the idea is that there's a very simple underlying algorithm or principle, and you just replicate it, you scale it up or out, and that produces emergent intelligence. Right. Yes. Well, okay. Then I am a universalist. Then I go. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, so, um, you know, but both of those, you know, the way you described it, it, do speak to some, um, I think, very pressing issues about um, structures and structure yeah. learning. Um, yeah. uh, that, you know, you could either um, read from the point of view of machine learning and sort of graph learning. What's the right, you know, how many layers does this particular deep learning architecture need or what kind of factorization am I going to put in play? Um, or if you were um, in um, radical uh, a radical constructivist, this you know that, that's where you know I've often heard people like Josh Tenenbaum, for example, think about sort of structural learning, and um, from the point of view of uh, the, the universalist, and now I've learned that new word. Now that's good. So as from as from, from, from as a universalist, um, then you are certainly looking for uh, the one principle that. Um, is redeployed at successive scales, yep. um, and um, that would, should be a sufficient explanation for those things that show um, emergent behaviours at particular scales. So I think that you know that that is absolutely true. Uh, um, and again, you can read this from the point of view of, of a mathematician, from the point of view of um, the renormalization group and what does that mean? Well, it just means that, you know, if I take lots and lots of little things um, and I start coarse graining them in a particular way, um, then if I want to describe the behavior of all the elements at one um, scale of organization, say molecules or cells or, or people, um, then if I can write then down their dynamics in terms of, say, a Lagrangian, you know, so some way of summarizing their dynamics that, um, and all the things that um, accompany or ensue from those uh, that dynamics, um, then if I do my coarse graining um, and then look at the collective, the average behavior 
obviously lots of cells, a place cell or you know, an a entire medial temporal or entire person um, at a more macroscopic level, then I should re be able to recapitulate the same functional form of the dynamics and all the Lagrangian. Mm -hmm. um, so from that point of view, um, you have a, a particular kind of universalism that is actually scale free because you get the same principle emerging at every level. And yes. that, that is basically um, one um, one way of looking at the deployment of the free energy principle is asking what would it look like when deployed at different scales? So you can deploy it at the level of dendritic self-organization, you can deploy it at the level um, of um, you know, uh, neuroscience, you could deploy it at the level of um, morphogenesis and cellular pattern formation. We've done that with Mike Levin. Um, um, uh, the idea being that this the same pr universal principle works at every every level. Mm. Then the interesting game comes between the coupling between the levels. How does one level constrain um, and inform or contextualize the level below, and vice versa? You know, and this I think is a really important sort of. Um, um, issue, which is probably well rehearsed in many different disciplines, ranging from, say, evolution. So evolution as a free energy minimizing process, where free energy is literally the um, the, mar the, the neg a bound on the negative um, um, log marginal likelihood, um, I name the likelihood of finding me, this phenotype here, when sampled at random from a population. Um, uh, how does that scale of a free energy self uh, autopoetic process, you know, natural selection, Bayesian model selection, if you're a statistician, how does that provide constraints mm -hmm. on the exactly the same principles um, of active inference and learning um, in developmental time for any given phenotype? And then the that would be the top-down causation. The bottom-up causation from one scale to the next scale would be, you know, how does my behavior, my experience, experience dependent plasticity, my evidence accumulation, all my good Bayesian decisions, how does that now uh, mean I contribute to the gene pool at the, uh, at, the at the evolutionary level? Yes. So, so that, you know, the, that, that would be one way of reading it. The other way of reading it, of course, is just if you're designing um, um, a TPU or deploying a TPU, um, you've got uh, you've got message passing on some graph. Mm -hmm. uh, what is a graph? Well, it only has interesting structure in virtue of the um, the sparsity or the connections that are not there. Otherwise, it's a full graph and it's not very useful for anybody. Speaking to Chris's Christopher's, uh, uh, you know. Uh, you know, too too big, uh, too many neurons. Um, you, you can't. You you necessarily have to have a sparsity to fit all those neurons into. Um, I would put it the other way around, though. I I would say that um, anything that is adaptive and has this size, uh, you know, what properties must it, it possess? And I would I would suggest that it has to comply with the principles of um, self evidencing. Um, where evidence now is the marginal look, the marginal likelihood, that can always be read as accuracy minus complexity. So, as it, if it exists and it's big, it's got to be minimally complex. What does that mean? It's got to have the smallest degrees of freedom, uh, the minimum number of connections in. So, you should be able to predict the sparsity from the first principles at every scale. So, that sparsity defines the nature of a graph and indeed if you're talking about anything that's deep in a hierarchical sense all you're saying is there's a particular kind of graph um, that I have in mind and it, it uh, you know has a, a certain sparsity structure but crucially it's a sparsity structure that allows me to uh, call it a hierarchy it means that there are no connections that transcend unlike a sort of you know a u-shaped uh, or is it? No, it's still hierarchical. To, anyway, sorry, I'm getting, getting a bit distracted by uh, the choice of graph. So, I mean, I think that sort of um, the notion of um, coupling between different uh, hierarchical scales is absolutely crucial from many different perspectives, renormalization group, evolution, um, you know, getting the right uh, graphical architecture and your message passing scheme in computer science. I think, you know. Yes, I, I wanted to bring that up. I, I discussed... Um, exactly the same thing with Levin, so uh, morphogenesis and the rungs of the emergence ladder and the causal pressures between those rungs and you know philosophers right. like George Ellis said that you only have causation uh, between the levels 
and uh, Douglas Hofstadter and Gerd Lescherbach and the strange loop thinks yes. that there's a very complex panoply of causal pressures between the scales. Uh, like uh, I gave the example to Michael, my mind is an emergent phenomenon and I command my hand to move. And he said that at different scales, you get different amounts of work. And actually, I think if you get into integrated information theory, it's kind of talking to that a little bit. And, and I think you think of consciousness as, as having a lot of um, information processing going on because it's at the top of the stack to, to some extent. But do you have any intuition on, on how that information is kind of partitioned between the scales and how those causal pressures work between the scale? Yes, I do. Uh, Wonderful. You, you, you're very well read, aren't you? Uh, so it's, it's nice that you, you, you mentioned George Ellis. I use the word top-down bottom-up causation exactly in the spirit that he writes about it. Oh, so wonderful. I had literally yes. had, it, had him in mind. But, yes. So I was hoping if he ever hears it, he'll, he'll know that I was talking about him. So it's exactly that. And it, it always makes me a bit queasy when I use the word emergentism, which I think since some people say there's no top-down causation in emergentism, but I, I don't fully understand the philosophy of it, but it, uh, just to acknowledge that. Sorry, yes, I, I've, I've distracted myself from your really important question, which... Oh, yes, the um, so the, the, the different scales um, of a Bayesian mechanic, uh, um, self-organisation viewed through the lens of Bayesian mechanics, um, I think um, what we've just been talking about, and I would imagine with... Um, with Mike as well, a lot of focus of uh, here uh, in that kind of work um, is, um, I hesitate to use it, but I will use it, spatial scales. You know, mm -hmm. how, how, how do element, how do single cells assemble into multicellular? Where, why, but, you know, how on earth can you um, envisage the emergence of multicellular organisms as Mike's done some beautiful theoretical work you know several years ago now just just think about it to be a skin cell to be an epithelium means you have to sacrifice the ability to reproduce so it's so if you like completely paradoxical from the point of view of natural selection you have to sacrifice yourself for the greater good yes. so there are you know there's some wonderful questions about uh, about um um cells of cells and of cells and cells as you build up to different levels of um, spatial scale but i think your question would be better addressed from the point of view of temporal scales um, and again you come back to this um, universalism um, now i'm getting fluent using that word <laughs> um, where you've got the same principle playing out yes uh, exactly the same principle exactly the same mechanics the same lagrangian um, playing out at different scales that um, where each scale contextualizes and has this circular causality the bottom up and top down um, um, aspects to it in play so my favorite example of this is just to um, look at a succession of belief updating um, processes um, from the very very fast which would be um, from the point of view of um, you know sentient machines it would be inference inferring states of the world as they are in the moments so of state estimation bayesian filtering um, um everything that um you know speaks to some kind of situational awareness on the basis of some smart and hopefully smartly sampled uh, data um and then we move to the next level i'm going to skip attention and precision but th there is an intermediate level which usually um in in the neurosciences has, has a time scale of you know you know, hundreds to, to uh, of milliseconds to seconds, but I'm going to I'm going to jump straight to learning. So, what's learning? Well, it's just slow inference. It's just basically um, slow belief updating, um, where the states that matter now are equipped with another kind of label, which we call parameters or weights in machine learning in, in yes. a neural network. Uh, but they're just random variables that are brought to the table to explain. Uh, or part of our world moral generative model but they're special um, kinds of parameters because they change very very slowly um, and then you move well okay so those are two levels what about turtles all the way down and turtles all the way up well, okay mm. what's the next level well the next level is now the structure so now for any given graph for example um, that is equipped with edges and those edges will have to have some um, slowly vary, uh, varying parameters um, that describe the you know um, the nature of the message passing on those edges um, there will be um, there will be a uh, you, you are conditioning on, upon a particular structure and, and you know is there a connection there is it a hierarchical is it heterarchical is it you know, a, a unit is it um, is it a transformer 
you know, as a, a convolutional neural network, you know, you've seen this wonderful evolution of structures in machine learning over the past few decades as people try out different structures and you know some work for one kind of application others work for others but um, from the point of view of your question what we are seeing is a kind of structure learning that's playing out over years so yes. this but it's exactly the same principle it's this free energy minimization but just in this instance the free energy now is a pathological it's just the average over a long period of time which is the um um which is the exactly the quantity that people doing um, structure learning or Bayesian model selection use when adjudicating between different graphs, usually um, mm. uh, of complex system models, for example. Um, it, you know, um, and you could argue that now um, over um, several tens of years or hundreds of years, that you know exactly the same maths could be leveraged to provide a formal description of natural selection as Bayesian model selection. Exactly the same thing as you're doing now when you're selecting whether to speak or whether not to speak or trying to infer, you know, selecting the right hypotheses about you know the narrative that, that you, you have in your head that makes sense of what I'm saying. Um, exactly the same maths and mechanics is unfolding over over the millennia um you know in terms yeah. of uh, in terms in terms of evolution so i th i think that's a nice example of the separation of temporal scales but the conservation of exactly the same principles that, that have this information geometry and implicitly intelligence uh, in the, of a basal sort i use the word basal because that's what mike levin and chris fields and jim glaze were like using is it's this notion that um basal cognition and basal intelligence transcends physics psychology and biology um it's all the same thing this is a line from chris fields who's a friend of uh, yes. Mike Levin. yes um and i think that's great a great notion um, um and i think you one can do that very gracefully by being a universalist and just by finding the right principle the right sort of um, reading of dynamics and you know that reading you know, well, you know for me is the information geometry that, um, that that supports the belief updating? I was going to do Markov blankets later, but it feels relevant now, and maybe we should bring a bit of continuous versus discrete in. So a few things came to my mind when you were talking about that. First of all, we, we think of um, emergence over time and self-organization over space, and. I guess it just occurred to me that are we only interested in time and space when we talk about this kind of structural learning? And then um, with these Markov boundaries, I had only thought of them um, in at, at one point in time, but you yes. could actually think of a kind of three-dimensional uh, Markov boundary um, over, over time as well. Now, just to remind our audience, um, blanket states facilitate the interaction between the internal and the external. Condition, conditional independencies, the external states are independent from the, um, uh, the internal states, as long as we know the intermediate blanket states. Now, um, to get to, the, uh, to a core issue that we've been modeling in complex systems, you know, like wh where do you draw these boundaries? And is it boundaries all the way down? Yes. Um, so I, I think you're absolutely right. This is the perfect time to bring up the sort of... Uh, I hadn't really thought about the, a notion of boundaries in time and, and sort of... Uh, um, that's intriguing. So, but you distracted me. I, I'll okay. think about. I'll think about <laughs> that after our conversation. Um, but no, certainly. So, um, there's certainly a lot of current interest in um, taking the notion of Markov blankets, which is foundational in this sort of reductionist lens of the free energy principle as a Bayesian mechanics. Um, mm. You know, one could could summarize the Bayesian mechanics of the free energy principle as simply just another kind of uh, quantum mechanics or uh, statistical mechanics that inherits just from this partition that is the Markov blanket that separates the, the inside from the outside. Yes. Um, now, um, and of course, there are lots of vexed issues about, one, well, how do you identify those Markov blankets and how long do they endure for? Um, so there's lots of interest in that at the moment, but one very simple approach to um, um, the question, how long do they endure for, is to say, well, that's not the right question because we've just talked about separation of temporal scales. Mm. So you have to say, at what temporal scale? Well, you uh, operationally define the Markov blanket as the, the time over which it exists. 
Uh, and what would that look like then when you suddenly now think about um, this, situating that temporal scale within the context of a larger temporal scale? So what you now have is a, a picture where big Markov blankets, blankets of blankets, things that define, say, you and, you and me or cultures or um, uh, um, nations, states or institutions that um, outlive, say, species, um, these big ones uh, last for a long time, but they contextualize and provide constraints on uh, Markov blankets at, this, uh, at a smaller scale that last for very uh, for, for, for much um, much shorter periods of time, mm -hmm. and so on all the way down. So that at some level, say at the, the molecular level, from your perspective, these Markov blankets may only exist for nanoseconds or your know, milliseconds. Mm -hmm. Um, but from the perspective of the molecule, thank you. you know, this, this is a lifetime and it's well happy complying with or can be understood as um, you know, doing its own basal intelligence, doing its own basal belief updating just autopoetically for its lifetime, which may only be a few hundred milliseconds, um, you know, making sense of its world or inter being interpreted as having this sort of, um, sort of you know, biotic intelligence and self-organization just because it exists for that period of time. So then again, this interesting question, you know, the, how does one time frame contextualize the other starts to bite and you, know, you start to now think about um, from the point of view of a slower time scale, what would um, a, a succession of Markov blankets uh, look like um, um, and what one uh, immediately um, encounters is the notion of a of a wandering or itinerant Markov blanket. Yes. Um, we spoke about vagueness on, on the first one, so we'll we'll park that, but the, the wandering sets is very, very interesting. But um I there there are two things that I that I think I, I wanted to understand. Um you do think that there's a hierarchy of blankets, but I'm interested in exploring this idea of whether the blankets could be observer relative. Because you used the word could be understood as a Markov blanket. And that brings up two things to the fore in my mind. First of all, the extent to which they are a lens versus describing something in reality. I see. And if they do describe something in reality, you spoke about this symmetric causal pressures, which we can we can speak to as well. But, but on this understood thing, it's very similar to um, Wittgenstein said, the meaning of a word is in its use, and that meaning in language is, is embedded in pragmatic actions and the language game and so on. And and then like the, the, the further thought occurs, well, maybe the, the understanding of a, a boundary or a you know, Markov boundary uh, blanket could be um, understood in the context of one's perspective. Right. That's a great question. And, and, um, and I, it may be informed by reading some of the, the philosophical literature <laughs> on that. Which, and I should remind you, of course, I am not a philosopher. So... Um, uh, so, so what I say will be naive. Um, you need to speak to philosophers about this, but I would, <clears throat> I would say the Markov blanket um, is is something which is metaphysical. Um, you yes. know, it, it 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 is defined by a particular sparsity structure when formulating any state space in terms of dynamics and specifically you know, uh, a Langevin equation. So one talks about the, f the free energy principle as a first principle account, um, but it does actually commit to something. It commits to the notion that there are states and that those states have a separation of temporal scales that disambiguates or separates systemic states from random fluctuations. So, but that's all it does there are no more assumptions and then everything else follows from that under the understanding that for sufficiently large systems the probability of there not being a markov blanket is um um zero mm. um so <clears throat> and this comes back to the sort of um this uh, sparse coupling uh, conjecture um that christopher i think was uh, alluding to um or at least we um we unpacked in terms of this, you know, that if a system comes to, uh, exists of a, and it's sufficiently big, it will be sparse. And once it's sparse, there, um, with probability one, will be Markov blankets. So at no point now have we introduced the notion of uh, observers. We haven't at this point even introduced the notion of the free energy principle. We're just saying um, there will be one way of carving up large dynamical systems, or certainly systems that can be expressed as a Langevin equation or a random dynamical system. 
um, um, will be ways of carving them up into one or more Markov blankets at one or more scales. Yes. Um, and then the question is, well, what um, what would it what what would one uh, how would one then describe um, the dynamics for any given Markov blanket? So. You, at this point, you are at liberty, if you are simulating a universe, to choose the Markov blanket and the scale that you want to simulate. If you're part of this system, you're not at liberty. Because if you're part of this system, you have your Markov blanket. So mm. all you see are the sensory impressions upon your Markov blanket. And you may or may not have active states. And it brings us back to the, sort of the bright lines that make between agents and sense-making machines that can't act sessile things um so if you're asking um am i um are the observer dependent perspective uh, dependent aspects of um this formulation using markov blankets as a um a epistemological device not if you're part of the system it says something quite profound about what you could, what, you know, what you know, and what, and if you're being observed by something else, if you believe, if your world model mm. is populated with the fantasy that there are other observers out there, yes, um, then um, those observers will never ever know your internal states. Well, what about rather than an observer, um, an actor or, or, or an agent? And we'll, we'll talk about an activism uh, in a little bit. But even at the microscopic scale, there are still affordances. And you gave this beautiful example of, um, of, of a, was it a type of species where someone might kill themselves for the greater good. And that, that shows the kind of information sharing that you have in, in these complex systems. So similarly, if I'm an agent in this system and, and I act and, and there are these, you described this cybernetic loop and there are these kind of symmetrical causal pressures and so on. And, and, and then you almost get this emergence of the Markov blank. So, so, so it's changeable. Yes, no, it's certainly, um, that's certainly true. Um, it is changeable and it's malleable and it's self-assembling. Uh, and certainly yeah. when you have Markov blankets and Markov blankets and coalitions of Markov blankets, for example, or formation of in-groups and out-groups and the like, yes. you would expect there to be a, <clears throat> a, you know, a dynamics of, of the Markov blankets or who you're relating to. So, you know, the sparsity uh, structure and who I talk to and who I listen to and, you know, what social media uh, you know, I, I, I commit to. <laughs> yeah. All of these things are um, products of or reflections and can all be articulated in terms of, you know, wandering Markov blankets. No, that, that, that's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, I, I, I thought you were, you, you were asking... Um, something more about um, whether the Markov blanket is part of a realist metaphysical description or whether oh, it's... That too, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, there is another argument that if you, if you now play God and you now put your universe in, in a computer and now to simulate and, and, and write papers about your simulated universe where you can see the, ins you know, the internal states, the external states, then you know, I think you're in a different world. Um, um, just I, again, I repeat, there's something quite profound about the, um, the questions of you know what is it like to be something um, are interesting because uh, from the point of view of the free energy principle, what is it like to be something means that someone's asking that question, so they are a thing, and they're asking about another thing. So now they're asking questions: what is it? What um, what is it like to um, know? the internal states of a Markov blanket, but by definition, you can never know them. Yeah. So yeah. there is something impenetrable about being something else. So it's a question which is unanswerable, it's unknowable. Um, um, so if, um, from that point of view, I think there's something uh, beyond the um, the sort of the epistemology of, you know, um, of Markov blankets, but if you're just simulating cells or people, or you know, doing multi-agent simulations, then obviously you can you can choose where to put your blankets, and you can you 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 can just use them as a device to um, to understand self-organization and to simulate it and to predict it. And I think in that instance, you know, the, the, you you could deploy your Markov blankets wherever you wanted to at every any scale you that you, you you thought was interesting for the phenomena of interest. That's not quite speaking to what you're interested in, though, which is the changeability of the, the Markov blankets? Or? Well, I mean, we can, we can get into that. Because um, if, if uh, 
and later on we'll talk about the the real world implementations of these ideas but um but it but if you if you did hard code the the markov blankets then you would bottleneck the system essentially so ideally you you would actually have the system defined at a sufficient resolution where all of this could could emerge um itself yeah did did, did you cover the point of whether the blankets can be um must they be spatially temporally con you know should they have a spatial temporal contiguity and the reason i'm asking that question is when you think of a blanket i like almost synonymizing it with an organism and maybe that's a bad thing to do and you can correct me but but if we think of um the discontinuous blankets in information geometry that's an interesting idea because we we kind of visualize them in 3d space don't yes, we in, in the, yes. yeah yeah well, certainly they will have a topology. I, yes. I, um, I mean, I've noticed earlier on you were talking about sort of place cells and grid cells, which yes. are you know, very special and beautiful constructs, which speak to a certain continuity or contiguity aspect. Yes. They, they suggest that these, um, you know, coming back to uh, Christopher Summer, um, uh, Summerfield's um, book, um, you know, one way of understanding the, um, the Markov blankets in the brain so, you know, we've been talking about Markov blankets delineating me from a world, but of course, um, your temporal lobe has a Markov blanket, as so it wouldn't be a thing. You wouldn't be able to call it a temporal lobe. So, you know, the very hierarchy could also be uh, described now in terms of um, uh, Markov blankets within Markov blankets within Markov blankets, and some really interesting questions about what that means for what, what part of the brain can know about another part of the brain and what and what action becomes, of course, it becomes attention. Yes. I, I just wanted to slip that in because I, I think that was in part what you were driving at with this sort of uh, context-sensitive fluid dynamics on in exchanges between Markov blankets. I think it's incredibly important. Mm. Even within the brain, in neuroscience, this is basically the, the routing of information, the deployment of um, selective attention or sensory attenuation, attenuating, ignoring some signals. It is exactly that that makes us such adaptive, context-sensitive information processing um, machines. And of course, it's, that is exactly what you'd have to worry about when designing a web with routing and, and, and context-sensitive. You know, who do I listen to? Uh, so you, you know, the, the, this is really, really important. Um, the um, so the the the, the emergence of um, I think. You're absolutely right. They will have a topology. And if I were using Markov blankets, and you know, I do and many other people do every day when um, thinking about uh, message passing as a statistician on factor graphs, or, uh, um, um, which are dual to a, a graphical um, model, uh, a probabilistic graphical model of the system you're trying to um, estimate or understand, um, um, then you know the Markov blanket is just the um, you know, the implicit knows that that, that, that I you know, that influence me or the or the parents of children and the parents of the children you know and that has enormous implications for minimising the complexity of the message passing um, yeah. and uh, you know it, and I repeat defines a hierarchy for example um, so uh, Markov blankets there will have a topology um, probably best understood practically from the point of view of graph theory as opposed to uh, um, 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 information geometry. Um, but there are special kinds of connectivity that you see, um, such as place fields. And I'd also say, if you just look at the history of machine learning, there are particular um, kinds of Markov blankets that characterize the very structure of certain neural networks. I'm thinking of convolutional neural networks. I'm thinking about you know, often motivated through weight sharing and the like. But, you know, if you look at weight sharing as just the kind of structure learning that's trying to minimize the complexity part of your uh, free energy or your um, um, negative um, log marginal likelihood, um, then what you are doing is finding the right kind of sparsity fit for explaining these kinds of data. What, uh, what, what, what is the architectural principle? It's, it's the translational invariance, the translational symmetry. Yeah. It's just the contiguity aspect. It's the fact that you are sampling data that is generated in or from a metric space that has a well-behaved metric. So I, I would say that sort of, you know, place cells and grid cells and many other, and many other, I'm thinking about uh, Chris's friend, Tim Barron's work, for example, um, finding grid-like structures everywhere Yes. in abstract spaces. Uh, so what that tells you is that, that, that it's likely that we live in a world 
um, where data are caused by samples from a metric space that has a you know a, a, a measure to it. Um, not all spaces do. Um, I think it'd be you'd be hard pushed to find you know, the right kind of metric for language, for example. Um, and certainly, if you're if you're if you're sort of building message passing schemes or um, belief propagation schemes on a factor graph, you, you don't you don't think about contiguity in a metric sense. You know, you don't measure the distance between one node and another node. It's just, is it connected or not? Um, so I think there are some special um, contiguity. Sorry, there are some special worlds that are recapitulated that emerge in the internal architectures of intelligent machines. Mm that have this contiguity property in virtue of the fact that some aspects of the causes of the sensorium are elaborated in a metric space, but not necessarily everywhere. And the, yeah. well, I want to take you back. To, I know you, 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 I want to where you want to take me. Anyway, what I, I, will, I will finish there because um, I see uh, in the brain and I also see in the direction of travel in terms of, um, building thinking machines um as you get deeper into these hierarchies and you go from a, a fine scale to larger scale there is an interesting move between um, um architectures that would speak to this metric aspect in space and in time to a more discretized topological non-metric representation Yes, I, I wanted to touch on that. I mean, there's a, a beautiful example. I mean, um, Christopher Summerfield talks about Pierce's triad and various ways that, that we learn different types of um, symbol and abstractions and so on. And, and there was a famous experiment in neuroscience, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with it, where they showed um, people pictures in, the, in a certain order and associations, and then the same topological structure was, was recovered, I think, in, in the NTL. And, and this is because even though with spatial temporal contiguity that there, there is a metric space, but the brain learns these kind of associations and then you can essentially learn these abstract concepts that, you know, concepts that reverberate in our language and, ex and experience, they get represented. Yes. I, and I completely agree with your um, point about the, the, the revolutionary idea of the, um, the translational local um, equivariance, you know, the, the, the weight sharing with CNNs. It's, it's a beautiful idea. It's, it's revolutionized deep learning. So um, just to finish off the discussion on Markov blankets, I wanted to talk about part-whole relationships. So um, for the benefit of the audience in logic and philosophy, myriology is the study of parts and wholes that they form. Uh, whereas in set theory, it's founded on the membership relation uh, between a set and its elements. And myriology emphasizes the relation between entities, which is to say the inclusion between them. So anyway, when considering systems, Markov blankets can nest into hierarchies. And what connection, if any, is there you know, between that and the philosophical study of uh, Mariology? And um, I was also going to bring in, I don't know if you've heard of Hinton's GLOM architecture, but it, 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 was, it came after capsule networks. Oh, and it's, nice. you know, we were just talking about these wonderful inductive priors in deep learning, and, and they, yeah. they make the problem... There are many curses in machine learning, but uh, one of them is kind of like the curse of optimization. And, um, and there's a complexity curse as well. And that's why most of these inductive priors, they reduce the size of the hypothesis set. If you reduce it too much, you get approximation error, which doesn't help you either. There's curses everywhere. But, um, but this is a really interesting prior as well, these part-whole relationships. Yes. Gosh, yes, there's so many issues you, you bring there. I'll just reiterate my favorite one which is the, the you know the the notion of um these inductive biases minimizing the complexity i think that's absolutely you know that's something which is absolutely central um from the physicist's perspective you know yeah. this um reading um self-organization as self-evidencing which is a philosophically poetic way of simply um describing existence as an optimization process which you shouldn't really do it's all it's really a principle of least action but you can read it as an optimization process what are you optimizing the evidence for my world models what how can i carve up that evidence complexity and accuracy what does having a what would i then mean by optimization well i mean just providing the simplest account that maintains a degree of accuracy what do I mean by simplest? Minimizing the degrees of freedom that I use up in 
providing that accurate account. How do I do that? By the right sparsity structure. What does that mean? It just means finding the right structure. And you know, you could actually think of much of evolution and um, the trajectory of machine learning architectures as this game of finding the right structure. That, that, that yeah. are just these structural priors that are apt for describing the kind of data. You know, so if you're you've spent your entire life doing MNIST images, then it's going to be the kind of structural prize that they are, that's, that, that inherit from being sampled from a metric space, and you'll have all the convolution. I think the capsule, I, I didn't I, I didn't know about the GLOM stuff. I, yeah. I always like listening to, to, to Jeff's um, um, latest ideas because he's always got the, the right kind of intuitions, and, and these intuitions are part of the, uh, I think, um, part of or a reflection of um, Ashby's law of requisite varieties, explored in hypothesis space about the very structures. Uh, yeah. the, 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 um, but certainly the, the, the capsule stuff and the, you know, the um, one aspect of structures of graphical models or implicit factor graphs when it comes to implementation, which I think is often neglected, um, is the orthogonal direction from, uh, orthogonal aspect, you know, um, in relation to hierarchical composition, and that's the sort of the breadth of a model in terms of um, having factors that can be separated. So, if you wanted to have, say, scene construction, you wanted to have um, multi-object, uh, you know, the ability to track and infer and and um, make sense of data generated by multiple objects. What are you saying? Well, there are multiple things out there, and these things. Um, again, from the point of view of uh, first principle account, have certain conditional independences that is literally revealed by a lack of connections in your world model. What would that look like? Well, if you're a physicist, it would just be a mean field approximation, literally factorizing, um, introducing conditional independences and factorizing a massive joint distribution, any one level in your hierarchical model into a number of factors that, um, if you're a neurobiologist, would now be functional specialization and modularity of a Fedorian sense. It, you know, what and where in the brain would be uh, you know, the, the, the conical examples. So I looked at that as, um, as a move towards paying more careful attention to the non-convolutional aspect. You know, those things that, that, that actually deny uh, a translational in symmetry and actually uh, celebrate the conditional independences within any one particular within any one particular scale. So my guess is, and I have no idea. So I'm talking from a, a point of view of complete ignorance. But my guess is that um, if it's an extension of capsule uh, networks, then it will have that aspect. It'll have that separability. That sort of things that can do stuff and, and account for attributes that are independent of other attributes or other objects that are that are conspiring to generate uh, the data. And certainly in my world of toy prototypes, generative models, usually in MATLAB, um, the, you know, then all the heavy lifting is done from the the mapping between the levels again. So all the interactions, you know, big red buses, you know, bigness, there's redness, there's busness, these can be factorized, but they all have to conspire literally through interactions and mm. highly nonlinear um, uh, um, operators. Um, in then generating what I would see if there was a big red bus. Um, so you know, that puts a lot of pressure on the the likelihood tensors or the mapping from, you know, you'll say a, a sense, an input layer to the, the first hidden layer, for example. Um, and then sort of leads you into all sorts of interesting issues about, you know, how do you accommodate that nonlinearity? And do you, uh, again, as looking at the evolution of machine learning architectures as an evolutionary process, um, you know, RELU or, you know, TANA, whatever, um, you know, that is another aspect of this sort of structure learning, I think would be very much finessed, I think, if we just move to sort of quantum operators and, and just go to discrete state spaces in the, in the spirit of quantum loop gravity, I think, sort that out, and then we can worry about what particular nonlinearities are. Uh, Anyway, so yeah. I wandered away. What was it, what was your question? My point. Well, well no, this this is a wonderful break point. So um, before we hit record, we were talking a little bit about ChatGPT, and just before we go there, because that's a fun discussion. I think one of the things that really distinguishes your your line of thinking. Obviously, there's the uncertainty, quantification, and so on, but um, also there's this idea of of an activism, and I wanted to just do a, a whistle stop tour of that 
as a contrast to these more monolithic approaches to AI like like chat GPT. So um, enactivism contrasts with representationalism, which is this idea that I, you know, I, I know everything about the world inside the model. And um, you said that you can't just think of the brain as some behaviorist thing. It's a dance of dialogue. You act in the environment, and the environment acts on you in a cybernetic loop. Now, you also gave the, I'm quoting like an interview that you did previously, you gave the example of radical inactivism, uh, that you can dispense of representationalism entirely. And you gave this beautiful example of, of this walking robot that kind of fell down a hill, and it did so, so gracefully, it looked like it was walking. It was all in the body, um, you know, if the body is sufficiently tuned to the environment, you don't even need cognition. And of course, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about a decomposition of cognition in, in a minute. Um, and, and you bring in this idea of circular causality. Uh, so we're causally embedded in the world bidirectionally, essentially. Now, w when we decompose con uh, cognition, um, I think of things like thinking and feeling and knowing and acting and, and the environment and, and so on. And I think this is one of the key things that distinguishes your, your line of thought. So could you give us a bit of a whistle-stop tour of, of an activism? Yeah. So um, an activism is at the heart of um, the circuit causality that, that, that um, follows from the very existence of a Markov blanket. Um, and a Markov blanket is a thing that would be, it's certainly in my world, necessary for the existence of something that is demarcated or individuated from something else. So just having a separation between thing and nothing or not a thing, um, having uh, that separation requires you now to think about the two-way traffic, um, the bidirectional traffic. And of course, now you've got um, two directions of travel that can be thought of as um, the agent, if you like, sensing the environment um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the agent acting upon the environment, or vice versa. Um, you've got now a circular causality, so coming back to sort of you know, the, the, you know, the, 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 the notion of a perception action cycle and this notion of a, a dancing and a, a dyadic exchange, which is bi directional, a two way traffic uh, between the two. So when you apply the free energy principle in practice to um, emulate or simulate sentient behavior, behavior that is predicated on sense making, um, then you are necessarily um, simulating action perception cycles. So you're necessarily an activist and that's called active inference. So sometimes just for fun, I put an EN in front of it called an active inference. Uh, I have to say that active inference was really a nod to active learning. It was just it's the same idea, but um, um, but cast in terms of fast belief updating as opposed to sort of slow evidence accumulation in terms of learning contingencies. Um, so that use of inactive is at the heart of applications of the free energy principle and obviously has been at the heart of, I think, all right-minded formulations of behavior and self-organization since Plato probably, but certainly, you know, uh, things like perceptual control theory, cybernetics, and, you know, all of that good stuff. Everybody at some point, active sensing, um, will you know will will um, have to commit to this um, active aspect, um, even to a certain extent semiotics. I think. Well, no, perhaps we shouldn't go there. Um, but the, the so that would be one way of um, sort of celebrating and foregrounding the role of action. Um, and what would that look like from the point of view of uh, machine learning and um, computer science? Well, it would look like basically smart data mining. Um, and it would change the nature of the game from um, big data, making sense of big data. So having everything on the inside, having access to the entire world. Um, and then making sense of that. And, you know, you may ask, what does that mean by making sense of it? Well, it's certainly doing something with it, like generative AI, um, versus um, the, um, the the complementary uh, approach, which is much more in line with this sort of complexity minimization and the imperatives for uh, sustainable self-organizing, self-assembling systems uh, versus smart data. Um, so the job, the action now is, is basically, what moves do I make on the world? to get the right kind of data that will serve my imperatives, what are my imperatives, to maximize the evidence for my model of the world. And if I can do that, by definition, 
my um, I will be there or put it the other way around if I you know if I exist then that is what it looks like I am doing so you know you talk about the or you mentioned this notion of sort of monolithic big systems um, versus small agile intelligent little agents and go and get the smart data that they need or that they think that you need. That is exactly um, the sort of picture that underwrites this notion of distributed cognition and that a different kind of network and a different way of relating to intelligent artifacts and information services and, um, and apps, uh, where it's lots of really small, smart things who are actively getting the right kind of data that they need to um, resolve uncertainty about the context in which they find themselves. Again, that you know, the complexity minimization gets in and things are really, I'm sure we've talked about this before, but I, I can't resist just um, mentioning it again from the point of view of sustainability and climate change. You know, you know, the direction of travel of these large, um, say large language models, for example, mm -hmm. is, is so wrong. Uh, wrong from the point of view of the ideology of climate change, but also wrong from the point of view of Landau's principle and the Janinsky equality, when read as a thermodynamic corollary yeah. of self-organization and non-equilibria. You know, you, you've got to minimize the complexity, minimize um, all of the internal machinations so that you, you just need the minimal amount of data um, expertly handled, Every little agent's a good scientist designing the right experiments to get the smart data that resolves its uncertainty about what it doesn't know. Uh, and the job done if you if you can do it like that. So that would be one, um, if you like, sort of answer to your question, you know, uh, um, the implications and the importance of inactivism used really just as a euphemism for an agent that can gather its own data. The radical inactivism is, I think, a more of a philosophical thing, and it's more of a fun argument. And I don't know any radical inactivists, so I, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't have, um, I don't have the right sensibilities uh, to, to really answer this question. But uh, it's from what I understand, um, they, you know, they, they have um, taken it a little bit too far and uh, are denying representationalism. Um, uh, to the extent that you know, the, 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 you can get a kind of um, um, sense making that doesn't actually involve any internal dynamics, um, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I'm sure that's true, and I'm sure that you're going to sell um, uh, Chat G uh, GTP to me <laughs> as, one, <laughs> as one, one, one example of this mindless kind of uh sort of you know enacted um uh, sense making um, i would just the opposite I, I think um i would call chat gpt extreme representationalism all right yes we'll, we'll, we'll resist the urge that we'll go there immediately after this i i, I promise but um so, so clearly we we think that intelligence does necessitate embodiment i, I think that's clear but yeah. i want to just explore this continuum between um, and activism and, and representationalism. Um, this is this is really interesting. So um, it, it, this comes down to grounding to a certain extent. So cognition must be grounded in different domains in, in the physical world, possibly in language, in acting, in affordances, in knowledge as well. And so this this is a view that that it that it is grounded, let's say, in in affordances, but if these agents, these organisms, ground their cognition in affordances, then to what extent could you say they are learning a world model if that model is with the lens of an affordance? I think I think you can sort of dis, um, reconcile um, very rich representationalism um, in the service of inactivism simply by noting that... Um, in this circular exchange, you have to deploy the right kinds of actions, and that's going to require, um, coming back to what we are talking about before in terms of planning, yeah. being able to build the right counterfactuals, you know, and to do 
uh, to do that in an expert way, in an intelligent way, you need to be able to represent the causal contingencies and states of affairs in the world at this time upon which you're predicating your next action. So, so I, I'm now thinking, you know, just looking at your, your, your expressions and, and, and uh, I now realise that you that you were trying to sell a dialectic between uh, inactivism and representationalism. For me, um, they are the same thing. Uh, you, to be a good inactivist, you have to have the right representations if you want to. When I say good, I mean um, good at a particular scale, the big things that survive. So viruses don't need to do much planning, um, but things like you and me do need to do a lot, uh, quite a lot of planning. So the, as you move up those scales, you have to look further into the future. So that we certainly need representations, which is what I have uh, which um, which is why I always smile, always smile when, when I think about radical inactivism. Uh, so if there's no space in radical inactivism for being able to plan, to imagine scenarios, to have narratives that play out on the inside before committing and selecting the right way forward, yeah. then it's not an apt description of, of um, certainly cognition. Okay. It's, it's so interesting because the, the, the question to me is, we just spoke about this idea of planning potentially through an information geometry. And many of the abstractions that humans learn are not grounded in the physical world at all. And that's very interesting. And we can get to how those abstractions are learned. But I guess what I'm saying is, let's say one of these agents in this multi-agent system, it's traversing this topology. What grounds the states in that topology? Well, I think that that would be um, ultimately it will be the transactions, um, you know, with with the world that underwrite um, at the lowest hierarchical level all the generative models of of this hierarchical sort. So the abstractions yeah. are just the coarse graining simplifications that you know the the um, the the products of literally looking at, at the lower levels of your hierarchy through a reductionist lens in the right kind of way that enable you to carve up the world in terms of these um, in terms of these uh, abstractions which may live in a non-metric space um, uh, they may still have this ordinal structure you were referring to before um, and then w what that would mean in the context of um, lots of similar artifacts who had done the right kind of coarse graining would be now the opportunity for uh, direct belief sharing, uh, brain to brain communication. Uh, speaking to a friend of mine, uh, Ehud, uh, yesterday, talk, talking about the distinction between communicating through um, um, the uh, through sensory um, um, exchanges such as language, but what we're actually doing is basically directly exchanging beliefs. Um, of course, you could do that directly. Um, in silico, you could actually have messages about what this agent believes at this abstract level of um, of representation, very high in a, you know, a hierarchical graphical model. It could pass its sufficient statistics to another partner somewhere else in the world, um, uh, elsewhere on that on that graph. So you do have the opportunity now for direct belief sharing. Um, and um, there are all sorts of interesting questions about you know how you'd engineer that. You you know, you can't coming back to this fact that you have to have sparsity in the game. You have to decide where to to send and receive your beliefs from. Then we have this sort of attention and routing problem. And then you have do you have peer to peer communication? Do you go through a, a server? Can you write that down in terms of um, quantum information theory as a holographic screen? And who's you know have uh, all sorts of really interesting things. But what they speak to is that you're, now you're sharing beliefs, literally, Bayesian beliefs, probability distributions, as encoded by sufficient statistics, that can be passed um, as messages uh, on, on, a, on a factor graph. Um, you're now talking about the ability for proper communication of the kind that has evolved in terms of cultural niche construction and evolutionary psychology that speaks to cultural niche construction uh, that we enjoy in terms of, you know, the, the the words that we use and the and the exchanges that we use. Yes, yes, in, indeed. So, so there there are two things to bring in. So knowledge and language, and you did invoke Andy Clark at, at, in another interview, which is the extended theory of mind. So it's um, one of the five E's in in cognitive science, and 
the the communication substrate could of course it, it, it's distributed so the two agents could be referring on missing information that actually exists perhaps in another agent or another another knowledge repository and then we can also talk to exactly what the role of language is yes. um, how it's compressed how it represents abstract concepts and so on um, so I'm very interested in knowledge and language I'm not sure if you could bring those in Right. Um, I'm not sure I can do so expertly, but certainly a part of learning new things since my foray into into industry is this notion of knowledge graphs. So, if you know, if you read a a, a, a probabilistic graphical model as um, at least its structure as being a knowledge graph, then embodied um, in the structure and presumably the parameters of the connections that constitute that uh, graphical model, that would be knowledge. So for me, um, in a very non-mysterious and possibly too simple-minded a way, knowledge is just the product of um, belief updating of a slow kind, which is learning. So I know contingencies um, in the sense that I have um, a suitably configured and optimized structure and parametrically weighted um, generative model that can be written down as a knowledge graph or a graphical model. Um, upon which I do my message passing to do my inference about the particular context sensitive in the moment kind of thing. So I would put knowledge um, um, basically as an attribute uh, that is implicit in a, um, a graphical uh, description of um, uh, an implicit generative model or world model that is um, actively um, that is used actively to do the data mining and to do the you know, do, do the inference and uh, and the sense making, and then the language part of it um, would just be that um, uh, highest level, most coarse grained summary that is conserved over multiple agents. So, just by definition, um, if I want to do belief sharing, um, I have to. Um, I have to have a, a shared generative model or a commitment to the same narrative so that the meaning of what I'm emitting is received in the right spirit or the right frame of reference by you. And indeed, um, there's some lovely rhetoric from quantum information theory of the kind that Chris Fields and Jim Glazebrook have been pursuing, where you literally have to uh, think about the generative model as a quantum frame of reference. And we have to share that in order to communicate. So in this instance, the um, the Markov blanket ceases, ceases to be just a set of states and, see, and, and uh, adopts the role of a holographic screen. And action now is writing to that screen and sensation is now reading from that screen. And there are two agents on either side. So you know, whatever is written is an action but can be read by something else and then you're looking at the entanglement yeah. which is the, the synchrony of mutual understanding that you know we would uh, aspire to uh, through through uh, through through communication so that 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 um, but that only works if if the messages that are written to the screen or written to the markov blanket um um have the same kind of interpretation so it speaks again to this um the, the fact that you have to have a good model of the world and the world has to um, um, and th th that really means that there's a kind of entanglement or syn uh, generalized synchrony from the point of view of dynamical systems theory between the two sides of your screen or the two sides of your Markov blanket or your server um, 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 which have a, you know, the right kind of isomorphism. So we're, we're talking about you know, basically a shared narrative that underwrites any exchange of signals. And again, what, you know, just thinking of, uh, of this from the point of view um, of generalized synchrony, what we are talking about is just the characteristic uh, or the emergence of characteristic behaviors in any sparsely coupled set or ensemble of things that possess Markov blankets or um, have a separability. Um, um, uh, what will they ultimately do? They ultimately find a, a, a synchronization manifold. They'll find uh, a synchronization simply because um, this is the um, 
the most likely state of being. And the most likely state of being is that which maximizes the marginal likelihood, which minimizes the free energy, which just means that they now understand and can infer each other. So you know, it's just another expression of this existential imperative to resolve uncertainty, have good models of my world. And my world also needs to have good models of me. And if my world is you, you have to have a good model of me and I have to have a good model of you. Ultimately, what that means is we're going to converge on the same model. Um, yeah, I mean, what interests me there is that unlike many other researchers, you're com conflating understanding, you know, knowing and intelligence itself. I guess, I guess so, yeah. Um, so, good question. Um, if intelligence is a process of belief updating, then yes, it's just uh, intelli intelligence and learning and just learning knowledge and intelligently inferring states of affairs are just the same process at different timescales and they both depend upon each other. So, I have to have the right neural network and the right weights and the right learning to make sense of the data in the moment. Yeah. And if you think of it from the point of view of uh, weight learning, um, either through back propagation of errors or through experience dependent or spike timing plasticity in the brain, you have to have the right inference in order to do the learning. So there's again this circular causality between the, between the two scales. So knowledge requires the right inference or state estimation, and state estimation requires the right knowledge to make sense uh, of of the data that's being assimilated. Yes, although I suppose, I suppose philosophically we could break it down because you know knowledge might be the sort of the information acquisition, because knowledge exists. It's quite an interesting philosophical point actually that knowledge is on Wikipedia. And it's crystallized knowledge. It exists mm. as as a thing, mm. but but the ability to to acquire knowledge without surprise is is is, is your your form of intelligence. But I, I wanted to talk about Chat GPT uh, just quickly, and it's very interesting because Bing have just released a new version of their search engine which integrates Chat GPT, and I've I've been um, on a bit of a journey when they released GPT three in the it was. November 2020, I got access to it. I thought it was garbage. It was just generating a load of rubbish, basically. But there were people out there who were true believers, and they said, "Tim, you're not seeing it. I, you know, like, I, I, I've seen it." And they would show me these ridiculous examples, and I just thought, "No, you're just fooled by randomness." And um, and then DaVinci 2 came out about a year ago, and then that that transgressed the anthropomorphic fooled by randomness threshold. So I, I started to be a bit of a believer. I knew it didn't understand anything, but it started to get very useful when I was using it for coding and generating emails and so on. Um, much to my loss, actually, because recently I've been checking code into the to the repo and my colleagues have been saying to me, Tim, it looks like you used uh, GPT to generate that. Why is it full of holes? And you have to hold your hand up and admit, oh, yes, sir. I'm sorry, I just gen I just checked in some code that I clearly didn't understand and uh, you know didn't actually save me any time. So sometimes you can see problems with its generation, but it's so plausible that most of the time they're hidden. And unfortunately, if you want to verify that knowledge, you might as well have just not bothered using GPT in the first place because you could have just gone. So a, a little recap, it's using a self-attention decoder transformer, and that's a neural network architecture that introduces a permutation invariance, two-tuple permutation invariance. Uh, which turns out to be extremely useful for language. And then there was this discovery of um, what's called in-context learning, which is where rather than just getting it to, because it, it's a generative model, it just generates token, token. You, you insert a prompt and then continue to generate from that prompt. And people discovered you could ask it questions. It had this emergent reasoning capability in, in big air quotes. And then more recently, people have done what's called preference fine tuning, which is that you do some additional supervision on the top with human preference um, examples, and that aligns it to, to humans and makes it give slightly more politically correct or, or you know more sensical answers. So, and now now it's been integrated into GPT, and that does this retrieval augmented generation, which means rather than just being a snapshot in time, it will also go out go out to Bing get some relevant search results, incorporate that into the prompt, and then generate from there. And there was this incident a couple of days ago where Bing had this successful launch to much fanfare. And then people looked at the results it was generating, including, you know, one of the, the, the things was, give me um, a comparison between the financial results of Lululemon and some other company 
and it was just hallucinating. The, 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 the results it gave weren't even in the document. And the product managers at Microsoft didn't even themselves bother to check the truthfulness of, of this generation. So God help anyone else using Bing. Um, so what's your take, Carl? <laughs> I love that story. Thank you. Um, as we were talking about before, I, uh, I've heard so much about ChatGTP, but I haven't been able to get on it because because it's always always being used over sub subscriber. It's a, it's a wonderful moment, isn't it? Uh, and so many issues there. Um, I don't know where to start with. Um, perhaps, perhaps I should start um, by um, conversations I've heard um, about why the chat GTP moment is so important. Um, always reduce really to um, the fact that people got in, you know, enchanted and had access to it. Mm. So it wasn't so much, other, but it's actually really interesting to hear about the technological and the structure of the generative model makes it work. I, I didn't know that. That was, that was very useful. Uh, but whatever, you know, the, 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 those are not really sort of quantum leaps. They're, they're, they're not massive technological you know, innovations. Um, but what the innovation was of the accessibility. So I think, you know, just standing back, why that was a moment, and it has been a moment, I think, you know, in terms of selling AI to investors and the like, they all they now, oh, you're talking about chat GTP like stuff. I know about that. That's really exciting. Uh, so it has changed the landscape, I think. Uh, and there has been a moment. Um, but why did it happen? And I think it's basically all this belief sharing. I think it's, you know, mm. basically... Uh, the participatory aspect. It is exactly um, this, um, if you like, sort of emphasis on belief sharing am among lots of smart agents, including ourselves, which is, you know, which if you can realize that potential and get in people engaged uh, is, the, is the nice way to use uh, artificial intelligence. Um, and in that respect, you, you, you ask yourself, well, how is it being used? Um, and it's being used as generative AI. Uh, and of course, you ask yourself, well, okay, what is, what's generative AI got brought to the table? Well, it's generating the kind of stuff that I would see. Um, um, and, uh, you know, basically it's an interpolation machine. It, you know, it's sort of if I give it enough stuff, it'll interpolate and, and, and generate the kind of things that I've given it. Um, so why is that useful? Well, you can now select from the stuff it generates. Uh, and, and it, you know, but all of this game is all quintessentially dyadic interaction or you participating with the generative AI. That's why it's so attractive. Yeah. It's not the marvelous stuff it generates. It just interpolates stuff. Um, you know, the interesting bit is when you now have the opportunity to select, oh, I like that one. I don't like that one. I'm going to triage that one. I'm going to check that code or I'm not going to check that code before, before uh, putting it in. Um, so looked at from that point of view, I think that both those, if you like, the um, why it became so much foregrounded in people's conversation and in the media, uh, and why more generally people are being, have been enchanted by generative AI, I think they both speak to the fact that you're actually engaging people. It's a dyadic exchange um, of an asymmetric sort, and that asymmetry um, is exemplified by generative AI that there's the, all the action, all the choosing, all the triaging, all the selection and what to actually show your friends or send off in your email is done by you, the human user. So all the inactive bit is actually done by the human still. You know, the generative AI in and of itself is not actually acting because it's generating content. The other interesting thing about generative AI is that it's generating content, not beliefs. So unlike Google Maps, which actually gives you a belief about the you know the best plan forward, um, it's actually generating content. It's in data space. So from the point of view of a statistician, or from the point of view of a physicist committed to a, um, a holographic screen or Markov blanket formulation of exchange with the world, um, notice that generative AI is doesn't have doesn't need to understand because that's not its purpose its purpose is to generate sensations to generate data to generate stuff in content space or data space stuff that has been mined in the space that the mining took place not in the sense making and the the abstraction and the understanding space yeah. so you know I, I think that's an interesting distinction, which, which um, that, you know, I'm, I'm sort of going off on a tangent here, but it, it's interesting when it comes to 
what do you mean by belief sharing and communication? But just look at that um, that observation in light of the discussion about why chat uh, gtp is so successful it's successful because it generates language mm. so the content now is the belief mm. and it's the kind of belief structures that have been honed through probably not is yeah certainly millennia of cultural niche construction and uh, so your language is a distillation the most efficient way that we can carve up our knowledge of our world our lived world yes. uh, and now the generative AI, which was previously just limited to generating pictures and content and sound files and whatever, um, is now actually generating stuff which is in a belief space because we have evolved language. So I, I think there's something quite special about generative AI and large language models simply because they actually generate content in, in the context of language which you know, has this um, speaks to knowledge. Uh, also, it has abstracted and distilled the kind of representations of of, of our world. Yes, th you know, in the most efficient way. Uh, that, yes, I mean there are so many things we can say there. They they are a materialized snapshot of our sense making, our abstractions, our world knowledge. You know, of of the Wittgensteinian language game, if if you like. But they also have a truncating effect, and they introduce inertia because. It, it, it's a static model, right? And yes. they are, as you say, they, they produce traversals in word space. And people don't understand that these are random trajectories with some kind of modified form of maximum likelihood estimation, uh, much more stochastic than people realize. And we can discuss the degree of how creative they are and what creativity is. Maybe creativity is just a random traversal through some abstraction manifold. Um, and I, I loved your poetic description of this kind of didactic relationship between humans and machines, much like an extended mind. And this is where prompt engineering comes in, because people have realized that you can say to the language model, that's not quite what I wanted. Can you change it a little bit? And it's an interactive process. And that's why as a conversational interface, it's very, very powerful. But the problem is, you can say to it, no, uh, two plus two doesn't equal four, it equals five. And it will say, oh, I'm so sorry, I actually meant five. <laughs> so it's it's polluting the infosphere with misinformation, yes. false news, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I never really thought the, the misinformation thing was a problem because, you know, there's loads of misinformation out there. I mean, mo most people are, are full of shit, frankly, uh, uh, Carl, but... Now it's been industrialized and democratized on this scale, and people will not bother fact checking. They're, that people see plausible text and they just take it as a given. And very, very soon, there'll be so much information out there on the internet, more than was generated by humans. Most of it will be generated by machines, and we won't know the difference. And that reminds me of, you know, one thing which um, the ambivalence that, that that whole issue induces in people. So you know this this um, this this tendency to write in meaning and anthropomorphize the, the you know the, the 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 content generated by generative AI. I've heard um, actually by the uh, by the second author of the white paper we started with, it smashed the Turing test. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I guess it has. I guess it has smashed the Turing test. Uh, um, but as you say, <laughs> there's, there's a price to be paid if you can't discriminate between sort of... Uh, you actually had a nice word, which I hope you're going to use uh, again, which is confabulation. Yes, yeah, yeah. You know, that's a great way of describing so it. So when I was talking about sort of interpolating, generating content, novel content that is an interpolation, it's, you know, that would be a confabulation. It's, yeah. I'm just uh, you know, um, mindful of the, the, the fantasies that, that, that uh, were generated by uh, Jeff Hinton's week, uh, sleep-wake algorithm or sort of yeah. the, you know, the, original, the original sort of um, amortization of... of, um, uh, of um, of um well yeah very short encoders i guess you'd you'd, you'd uh, think about nowadays um but the you know this notion of confabulation i think is, is is a splendor i haven't heard it i haven't heard it expressed like that but but that is but that is a beauty of it for, of generative ai i guess what yeah. you're saying is if people misinterpret that as real information that could be problematic um i'm 
too I, I i'm being a bit older than you i'm sort of slightly more mellow about this but i'll just very quickly tell you a little story i had to for a friend or a colleague at least an email colleague um in america i agreed to uh write some blurb for his um uh 200 plus word book which is a philosophical model but he's also very informed in terms of artificial intelligence mm. and he sent it to me so i speed read it at the weekend in order to write a three or four sentence blurb for the publishers yeah. um and halfway through, I suddenly had the awful realization that this may have been written by, by Chat GTP. Oh, no. <laughs> and uh, it's a wonderful book, and I wasn't quite sure. Yeah. So I actually put in the blurb this, this is a 21st century Turing test. Uh, the, uh, you know, either, and uh, you know, I'll just advertise it now because it'll probably come out by the time people watch this. I think it's called The Hidden Illusion. Yes. Uh, and either this author was very, very skillful in writing the book last year and preempting um, the public release of, the, of these things, preempting to the extent he could emulate the confabulation of a large language model. Because part of the novel, actually, because the, the, the protagonist, the hero, is actually working as a, on large language models for a tech startup. It's a love story, right. yes. but it's yeah. interwoven with things that he's actually generated on his large language machine. Yes. Um, and, he, um, and that comprises part of the model. Um, but I, I generally don't know whether the rest of the narrative was, was actually written by a large language model, and then he's carefully gone through and triaged it. That's entertainment, but it is entertainment that, that really challenges, can be viewed as a Turing test, which I suspect most people will fail. And I suspect that book will be talked about simply because it's very difficult to tell how much he wrote versus how much the machine wrote. Uh, and, you know, so, but that, you know, as long as it's kept to entertainment, that's fine. If it's not, then we come back to smart data mining. We come back... Um, to intelligent agents that just don't confabulate content in the context of generative AI. You actually need um, the ability of smart agents to go and you've talked about fact checking. What does that mean? It, this basically means um, having um, uh, uh, an explanation or a belief at hand that provides an accurate account of all the data that is internally consistent. So I came yeah. coming, coming back to the, the fundamental principles of good modeling um, that can be quantified. But to do that, you're going to have to um, equip those agents with autonomy and a sorry, to make equip those smart data mining machines with a, autonomy to be able to select the you know, the right kind of data that will hopefully preclude the the, uh, the confabulated data that, or things that look like data but are in fact not uh, not data. Yes. I don't know how you do that, but I that's, that's going to be the challenge for the future. Well, exactly. I mean, in in the free energy principle, um, that you have this entropy, and 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 it will actively seek out. GPT never says to you, "Oh, I, I don't, I don't actually know that." Can can you explain? Can you explain more? Different modes of understanding, right? So. The reason why we don't confabulate is because we actually understand things and these models just learn very, very superficial surface statistics um, about language and, and how it's used. And I think it's going to change the, the peer review process because now so much of this stuff slips um, beneath the net and the amount of um, due diligence and rigor that is required to weed out some of this stuff because most of it has gone undetected. I think that's the problem. People don't realize how big the problem is because the mistakes are not immediately um, obvious on, on the surface. So um, you said that we believe that developing a cyber physical network of emergent intelligence in the manner described above not only ought to, but for architectural reasons, must be pursued in a way that positively values and safeguards the individuality of people as well as potentially non-human persons. And I wanted to bring in the is ought problem as articulated by David Hume. Um, he said it arises when one makes claims about what ought to be that are based solely on statements about what is. And Hume uh, found that there seems to be a significant difference between descriptive or positive statements about what is and prescriptive or normative statements about what ought to be. And uh, that it's not obvious how one can coherently move from descriptive statements to um, prescriptive statements. And I do want to draw a little bit of an analogy here to our discussion about consciousness. And I, 
I, I, I can bring in consciousness again, but you know, Chalmers said there's this kind of um, hard problem and consciousness is a little bit extra. And similarly, um, people say the same thing about morality, that it's a little bit extra and it might not be deducible from all of this empirical um, uh, data that, that we have in our, in our models. And uh, Hume, of course, was a famous empiricist. And, and I think you are one as well, probably the, the extreme version of that. So um, the free energy principle concerns itself with model evidence and entropy. But evidence is not an ought. Uh, you know, so the question is, how do moral states um, come into be in, in the system? Right. Okay. I didn't know about the is ought stuff. That's really nice. Um, um, so if I understand what you said correctly, um, then is is ought that the, the completely dissolves the distinction. So if you, you know, from the point of view of the free energy principle, um, existing in particular characteristic states are those attracting states. They are part of an attracting set that define who I am and collectively who we are if we share the same kind of world model or narrative. Um, so they are exactly how I ought to be. They are stipulatively defining the nature of the thing that I am. So if I exist, the is, is just the ought. Um, and that's quite fundamental because if you, if you then say, well, what then does um, a distributed cognition or an extended cognition, uh, you know, this, um, or a, de a designer environment on the web, um, you know, you know be, be being Andy Clark for, for a moment, if, if you think about what that might look like from a first principle account, then um, what ought it to it look? Uh, what ought it to look like? Well, it will look like what it is. Um, but being what it is, if it includes us, it will be like us. So it will um, it will be effectively um, uh, the kind of uh, system where you cannot prescribe any oughtness, it, you know, because it is what it will be, and it will be. Um, it will, um, as we have um, learned in the previous conversations, it will come to share a narrative in a world model with certain levels of abstraction in our own world models, provided it, it, we are part of that um, that ecosystem, part of that network. One could imagine a completely independent, you know, Markov planking between us and uh, an information, you know, uh, a, a world wide web which was never used. So, um, so it would, wouldn't be a Markov planket even, it would be too separate systems um, and there will be a universe where the, the world web does what it does we will never know by definition uh, but if we are part of that if we are users of either in the sense of um, triaging generative AI or enacting recommendations um, or supplying data um, and um, um, you know, so we are in a, a, an exchange and therefore part of that web, a part of that network, part of that factograph, a node on that factograph, um, then by definition, the is equals ought as read by the free energy principle means that, that what will happen is all the intelligent artifacts on that web will converge to some kind of common ground and some kind of common sense making. Another way of looking about at that is that you know, what are the imperatives? What are the things that are being optimized? If if you want to use an optimization um, um, approach, um, it's the um, the effectively the expected free energy. Um, what is that? It's just minimizing uncertainty, minimizing surprises. It is not making paper clips. It is not you ought to be good to mankind or you ought to um, increase prosperity. Um, um, it is not monothematic. Um, pre-specified heuristics about this or that. It is just, um, um, it is all about resolving uncertainty and when there are preferences that underwrite that uncertainty, just technically, just in case it, um, this sounds a bit too hand-wavy, the expected free energy is literally the sum of the expected information gain and the expected value where the value or the negative expected free energy is the sum of the expected information and expected value, where the expected value, where the value is the, um, the log probability of a characteristic outcome. Now, crucially in that statement, where you now read value or utility 
or the Ortners um, yes. as um, a, um, a probability distribution over the space of outcomes. Notice that this is now specified over all possible outcomes. So it now becomes a way of specifying Ortners that just is um, in the spirit of multiple constraints over all dimensions of outcomes. Not the amount of money I make or the number of paper clips I make, but over everything. And over everything then converts this effectively into a sort of the solution to a multiple constraint satisfaction problem where the multiple constraints are definitive of what I am. And if I am embedded in a network of sympathetic uh, agents and artifacts, what we are. So baked into this kind of belief sharing, there should be a harmony and a mutual understanding at various levels. I mean, I'm not talking about sort of direct sort of language to language. You know, it could be sort of sensory substitution devices that have a sort of very elemental, very fast uh, sympathy with with our bodies, for example. Um, but the, uh, you know, at least from the point of view of um, the information geometries, that, that there will be a convergence, which will be effectively... If you're a quantum physicist, an entanglement. If you're, um, if you're a, a, a dynamical systems theory person, a generalized synchrony of everybody in that web that is necessarily uh, a facet of free energy minimization on the one hand. On the other hand, it's also just a statement of the steady non-equilibrium steady states to which any distributed network will ultimately um, converge to. It can be no other way yeah. in principle. Yeah. I mean, many people have an intuition that when designing utility functions, if you look at how markets work and, and so on, that uh, utility and value are orthogonal. And, and then we have institutions like the church and government and, and so on to introduce value pressures um, onto the utility function. And I, I guess what I'm, what I'm getting from you is certainly from an evolutionary perspective that they, they need not be orthogonal. And um, I mean, in, in religion, for example, I mean, I'm not religious myself, but they they have um, they're moral realists and you, and you have moral relativists. And, and they, they say that um, we need to hold something sacred uh, because otherwise, you know, if everything's sacred, then nothing's sacred at all. So we need to have a difference between the sacred and, and the profane. But um, they, they think that uh, morality shouldn't be achieved through consensus. And this is this is what we need to behave properly. I don't believe that. But I'm very interested to know where morality comes from. And I think you kind of alluded to that in, in, in your answer. So um, are they hardwired in the brain or is it just a kind of like constructivist social phenomenon? I think it's a constructivist social phenomenon, but uh, and over a transgenerational sort of niche construction as well, uh, but also um, in the moment. Um, and constructivist in the sense that the we're not born with these things, so these things are very much part of cultural, um, cultural evolutionary thinking and sort of you know um, um, nurture um, that we inherit not just from our mum but also our mum's mum and mum mum you know right, all the way back. Yeah. Um, so they are in the brain; they are learned, which are um, distinct from innate priors that underwrite my homeostasis. So there are certain beliefs I have, subpersonal beliefs, about the way I should behave um, that are held with incredible precision and conviction, subpersonally, uh, that, that hardwired epigenetically. And these would include everything that um, um, leads to homeostasis. And then you build upon that and you get to allostasis and you build upon that and you can probably at some level get to the right way to behave morally and ethically at school with your, in the playground, for example. Um, so as you, uh, you know, so mathematically the, the distinction between these sort of um, very fixed um, prior preferences or prior beliefs that are basically just an encoding of beliefs about the states I characteristically occupy or aspire to or to or narratives that I would pursue. Um, they are very, very precise in some dimensions. You said, you know, they are or are not orthogonal. You know, it was exactly that sort of multidimensional aspect to writing down value of something which would be impossible to do for a, a human being unless you you gave me your DNA and also your mother's womb. I, I couldn't actually write, write, write it down very, uh, very easily. Uh, but you know, uh, the specification has to be upon all dimensions, mm. some of which will be written down with great precision. 
and others will be much more flexible. And I think when it comes to um, writing down values over attributes that do not yet exist because you haven't grown your deep generative model sufficiently deep in order to have that degree of abstraction, then clearly those kinds of beliefs about the way I should behave um, are not even specified at birth, but they have to be learned through interactions with other people. So I guess I'm trying to bring to the notion that it's perfectly okay to have a um, a spectrum of different um, convictions about the way to behave that can be um, absolutist or it can be more forgiving and relativistic simply and you you would be able to simulate that just by writing down very very precise beliefs versus um, less precise beliefs I think the second key thing here is that um, we're, we're talking about um, when it comes to the um, building beliefs about the way I should behave that basically presupposes you've got to a sufficient de developmental stage to have selfhood, mm. which not everybody gets that far. If you've got severe autism, you, 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 you wouldn't. Uh, uh, and if you, you know, certain other li uh, lower life forms may not, never get that far. But certainly you have to have um, selfhood. You have to have a model of that selfhood. And then you have to um, um, ask, um, have a model of um, others that may be actually be a prerequisite before you have a model of self and then other kinds of people so um, when it comes to making decisions of a moral or ethical sort you know, it's just inferring what would i do in this context given i am this kind of person and my limited understanding of sort of social science is it's a little it's a little bit more complicated that is not necessarily what should i do in this context give a mind that kind of person it's what do you think i should do given i am in this context given uh, what you think what kind of person you think i am so basically i'm trying to work out what you think what kind of person you think i am if i can infer that on the basis of our exchanges and my epistemic foraging and my sort of self-evidencing through language um, then um, I can then decide what is right or wrong. So it's just basically an inference. You know, what's the probability of making that decision with those outcomes, given my world model, um, if I am that kind of person versus that kind of person? Um, to solve that, uh, I need to know what kind of person I am, and that I can just get from mum or I can get from my, convert, uh, my correspondent or my, or my peer group. Um, or I can choose to, you know, my in-group from the social media or the, the, the kind of television news that, that I subscribe to. Mm. So, you know, we were talking about before about sort of this utopia of um, generalized synchrony and perfect quantum entanglement, and we're all in perfect harmony. Of course, it doesn't quite work like that. There, there, there's a scale-free um, um, sort of specialization and you know different uh, you're know, at a bigger scale different markov blankets where you get yeah. in groups and institutions and uh and because of that scale freeness and because of it we're all quintessentially curious in our self-organization we're always exploring other ways of being um whilst trying to find the shared narrative and common ground with people like me my family my institution my uh, um my sort of um, um theological uh, commitments um, there will always be other kinds of me, and mm. I and I would, can sometimes you know I can I can sort of be that kind of me or the other kind of me. So in that context, it's really a, a really interesting question about um, really inferring you know the, of all the ways I can behave, what is the most likely way of behaving, and if you can you know if you if you look at morals and ethics through that lens then you have now a calculus of being able to write these things down in terms of alternative ways of responding in a given situation. And crucially, you mentioned before uncertainty. So precision is just the inverse uncertainty, the confidence with which I can assert, no, I will always do this. Yeah. As opposed to, I'm you know, 80% sure I'm that kind of person. Uh, uh, but also noticing you're now conditioning your moral position or your ethical uh, position um, 
on being a particular kind of person. And of course, we can all be a different kind of person. I can be a teacher, I can be a student, I can be a parent, you know, I can be a friend. Um, you, know, you know, all of these will call to four different sets of, of prior beliefs because they're all conditioned on the kind of the, the library or the repertoire of ways of being a human being, which I learned from you or my mum and, and everybody else on yes. the television. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I wanted to touch on this idea of, um, I mean, as you say, you believe that it's socially constructed, which rather gets away from this notion of some people believe that it's kind of hardwired. And then there's the notion of is our, you know, our values might be changing faster than evolution, essentially, which necessitates the need to have some kind of societal pressures or, or governance, if you like. And I do believe that we're in a new regime now. I mean, people always say, oh, the, the sky's falling down, everything's changing. But now we are in uh, the information world and things are moving at a scale and magnitude that they haven't done before. And our values are changing much faster than they have done before. And what you were talking to is very interesting about this kind of fractionation. So there are macroscopic pressures and there are microscopic pressures. There's the internet and so on. And I just wonder from your perspective, how do we, how do we wrestle with that? Because there are, we've never been in, in, in a, a more kind of pluralistic, interconnected environment. And how does that affect us? Yeah, I, I mean, these are big questions, <laughs> which I'm sure you have your own answers to. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think I think that that, that, that sort of fast moving, um, globalized exchange um, that 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 does speak to a deep pathology. Um, and I have a deja vu. I'm sure we've spoken about this before, but sort of you know, um, Zuckerberg and and, and the, you know, the genius boy racism of of. The, the previous decade, um, talking about connectivity as somehow being a good thing, I, yeah. I find quite frightening. Yeah. Uh, remember that we've been talking about um, structure and existence uh, right through to morals and ethics in the context of having the right kind of sparsity that gives you the right kind of individuation of things from the world and within any given thing, the right kind of structure that allows it to act gracefully uh, and in harmony with that world. At every point, it's the absence of connectivity that defines the structures. So if you destroy that sparsity by over-connecting, over-globalizing, you will um, essentially destroy, it will be basically cancer, um, you know, so if you look at, this is a Mike Levin thing, if you look at, um, you know, sort of a cancerous cell as a, a, a basically self-organizing system who has forgotten its boundaries, yes, then you are, um, you have a metaphor for the kind of thing that happens if you do not respect the sparsity of communication and the, um, the, the joyful uh, um, isolation that, that, that is existence behind your own Markov blanket. So every affront to um, that uh, maintaining that sparsity, smart data carefully sampled, not being overwhelmed with a deluge of um, very imprecise data, that it makes it very difficult for me to actually go and smartly sample and work out what would happen if I go and um, look over there or look on that website. Yes. Um, you know, so what that would suggest to me is that um, th there will be, um, there will be, and I take your point that, that things are changing. Um, I, I initially thought to myself, well, no, hang on a second, because all of the information and the sense making and all the, all, all the kind of um, exchange of information we're talking about is about constructs that do not exist when I am born. Um, you know, you can't have you, you can't have misinformation uh, from the um, what you called the confabulation, what I in my blurb referred to as the, the flighty ramblings of GTP. Uh, <laughs> Um, um, you know, you, you can't, you, that has no meaning for some, you know, a child that has not yet learned to read or write or to, to, uh, to you know. so this is something that has to be below the scale of evolution. So I was just thinking, no, nah, it's okay. You know, uh, this is a, a, you know, this is limited, um, to, um, you know, each, each, um, each, each, uh, generation, but I think that's probably a false, <laughs> false, uh, uh, um, uh, comfort um, because you know we were talking about sort of um, evolutionary psychology and cultural evolution as well. And I think that's what you were talking about. I think that 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 then is, is if things are speeding up, 
um, that usually means that you've lost um, you've lost precision in your prior beliefs, which means that the precision, the informativeness, the salience, the reliability of information now takes precedence, and you increase your learning rate. You become uh, in schizophrenia that we call as jumping to conclusions on the basis of sparse information. You're basically looking out there, not inside, uh, to um, resolve uncertainty about states of affairs because you've lost confidence in your uh, your in your uh, very structured uh, prior beliefs. So if things are speeding up, that basically means that um, wh- whoever is now generating um, and garnering that information in the information age um is has lost um has lost confidence or precision in the in their own convictions and prior beliefs and possibly information morality uh <laughs> so what's going to happen um i, I read um carlo bravelli's book um uh, 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 yesterday in fact he, oh, wow. he's he, this, this, he wrote in 2014 just sort of seven things you need to know about physics it was originally um published each chapter as a, you know in the in the the um the sunday newspapers with pretensions to scientific discourse and then mentioned a little book but he ends up with a very very pessimistic he thinks it's all over <laughs> I, I was actually compelled with by that he just, you read the last few pages uh, yeah. uh yeah. he makes exactly the same points that we we just been discussing yes. from the point of view of physics um at, at different levels um and, and 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 he you know, he generally thinks it's over. It's uh... I know it, it's so hard because it's like the hill climbing problem, and you can't see behind the next hill. And there are always people who were, uh, you know, techno luddites and people who think that the sky is falling down. It's genuinely hard to know. Just just to finish on on this um, ethics point, uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett was a constructionist. She had a book called How Emotions Are Made: The Secret Life of the Brain. And she thought emotions themselves are socially constructed. Uh-huh. Would you subscribe to that view? Um, I think I probably would. I mean, she she writes very wisely and has thought for many decades about the you know the nature of emotion. I think you know I I, I would say yes, absolutely. It's simply because uh, you know the um, the notion of building generative models in a neurodevelopmental. Uh, context is an act of construction you know it's a free energy minimizing process that um is um that, that explains why we construct better and better explanations which are sort of you know carving nature in its joints in our head and part of that is <clears throat> is um not just about the state of the external extraceptive world but also our, our internal world our interceptions our gut feelings our respiration our um, and everything else. So, so her big thing, and indeed other people thinking along similar lines, people like Anil Seth in, in, in um, sorry, will would really uh, always ha- a nod towards interception and embodiment, but now beyond the the, the situated cognition kind of embodiment that you, we were talking about before, but actually now about the, the physical body, the, 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 uh, the beast um, machine, as, uh, as, as Anil Seth would, uh, would say, so the physiology. So um, having a constructed explanation or hypothesis for the way that I put together my gut feelings, my interceptive signals, with situational awareness derived from extraceptive sensations and indeed what I do about it I think leads to a very compelling notion of constructed emotions so for example um, I am um, I can infer I can use the explanation on the hypothesis I am frightened as the best explanation for why my heart is racing why I feel frozen proprioceptively why I have cardio acceleration um, why um, I have, uh, why um, I cannot discern that dark figure in this um, dark alley in a city which I've never been in before. All of these myriad of um, uh, sensations and my low-level constructs now succumb to a simple explanation. Oh, I'm frightened. Yes. That explains everything. It explains my racing heart. It explains the fact I can't I can't see who that is. Uh, you know the potential predation that um, um, would, would follow from from that. Also, interestingly, because of you've got this circular causality and the inactivism, the fact that I am frightened 
means I expect to um, cardio accelerate. Yeah. Uh, and of course, under active inference, that's exactly what will happen because you're acting to generate the evidence for your predictions and for your 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 hypothesis about your you your uh, uh, you in your lived world, but also you as you hypothesize yourself to be. So you've got this sort of closing the circle in a sort of James Langian kind of sense that yes, I explain my my current set of sensations as having the emotion of fear that itself induces the very evidence that I was trying to. So you've got this sort of auto poetic self fulfilling prophecy that you know is just idea motor theory, but in the interceptive domain. Yes. Uh, so I think if you read constructed, that's right. But I notice you said socially constructed, which I, I guess is okay. Yes, if you're taught that you can be, have these, uh, you know, this kind of fine-grained repertoire of feelings, or you can use these to explain your own sensations. Yes, I, I would imagine it is moulded by, you know, by, by, by convention and, uh, you know, by the culture which you come, come from in, in the same way that, you know, um, Eskimos having 12 words for snow would give them a finer visual acuity and visual discrimination of whiteness. I, I'm sure that exactly the same kind of um, cultural enculturation uh, speaks to different kinds of alexithymia and uh, you know, the coarse grainness of my repertoire of explanations for emotional states of mind that best explain me in my, you know, in my interactions. Now, Carl, I know you have a background in psychotherapy. Can people be evil? Can people be evil? It doesn't exist in the diagnostic criteria, I believe. No, it doesn't. Um, so <laughs> that was out of the blue question, uh, which I've never um, been asked in public before. Um, as a psychiatrist, I think it would be rather difficult to conceive of that. Um, there, you know, there are certain there are certain uh, patterns of behaviour, and um, I do have some psychotherapy, but it's group psychotherapy. But really, I'm a psychiatrist. So, you know, there's a distinction, I think, um, right. uh, um, from a professional point of view. You know, I'd be more like a biological. Uh, my apologies, I didn't mean to. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah. No, no. I mean, the, the psychotherapy is an important uh, aspect of of psychiatry. It's just that yeah. um, 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 psychotherapists have to undergo, you know, five, six years of training to become psychotherapists. I did two, two years of very baby uh, psychotherapy training. Um, but, um, you know, in terms of uh, the, the nosology and psychiatry, you can certainly get sort of um, certain kinds of personality disorders and, and certain as, you know, kinds of psychopathy that would normally be associated with evil, um, evil behavior. And it normally basically... Um, transcends the social norm, so it comes back again to basically me trying to work out what kind of person do you th should I be, which you know, my only point of reference is you. So you know how should how do I think you think I should behave, and when that um, when that kind of self modelling doesn't work, then you will be you 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 will have um, behaviours which are so far from the social norms and yeah. morally acceptable. I guess you could label them as being evil. When could they arise? Well, when you fail to um, have any theory of mind, uh, for example, if I am unable to see you as a another thing like me, so I may see you as a fridge or a car or some sort of you know, camera or an artifact, um, you're not a person. You know, you don't have intentional dispositions or uh, you don't have, we don't have a shared narrative. I couldn't talk to you in, uh, in any really deep sense. Um, then obviously I can never ask the question, how do you think I should behave? Because you do not, you know, you don't have that kind of belief or that kind of intention, intentional stance in relation to me. Um, so you could imagine that some, you know, some um, kinds of um, psychiatric conditions that preclude proper theory of mind and, you know, the ability to sympathize or, or empathize or bond um, would enable the expression of certain behaviours which would be regarded by other people as evil. Whether the person prosecuting them thought they were evil or not would, would of course be a mute question, one you'd never know because it's inside her Markov blanket. But uh, uh, but also, uh, from her point of view, there is no reference and that is the problem. 
Yes. They're, you know, um, but you can certainly have somebody else out from the outside saying that is evil. Um, you normally don't, you try not to do that when you're doing psychiatry or psychotherapy. You have to have conditional positive regard. Yes. So you, you, you can't really impute uh, nastiness or evil or um, bad intentions. Um, yes. And, and it's one of these things where um, autonomy comes into it. Free will comes into it. Possibly, it, it, it you know, evil itself is a constructed concept, um, which um, uh, exists in in our language, and, and it's something which some people will perceive depending on uh, lots of other things they believe. Yes. But um, okay, and talking about ethics in AI, it, it, it seems to suffer from a similar um, form of fractionation in, in the sense that different people with different beliefs think that it should be enforced in, in different ways. What's the solution? Well, I, I'd take a, a, um, a sort of deflationary approach. Um, the, um, and it won't be a terribly informed approach, but you know, my answer would be, well, if you get the right, um, the, the right optimization, the right imperatives in play, then the, 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 that kind of question just goes away. Um, I think... Um, one way that I have heard this discussed, and I actually enjoy discussing this with, uh, you know, with, with my colleagues and friends, um, is that there is this dystopian meme, you know, the singularity, the paper clips paradox, everything yeah. you see in, uh, you know, sort of com um, you know, on comic films uh, of a futuristic dystopian dark, very entertaining. I mean, that's the first things I go for when going to the watch list. But, but, but they, they are all dystopian in a rather unconvincing and fantastical way. Um, and you have to ask yourself, well, why, why are they, um, why do people have this sort of dystopian... Um, uh, view of um, realizing the potential of um, you know art, what used to be called you know, AGI or uh, um, and um, I think it usually inherits um, from that uh, distinction when you were you introduced the is and the ought yeah so what should a good AI what ought it to do and who's in charge of saying who, what it ought to do is it meant to make money is it meant to make profits is it meant to save lives is it meant to um, make paper clips um, because that question just goes away if you're thinking um, in terms of um, the free energy principle and, and, and active inference and belief sharing so the only agenda in sharing beliefs is to resolve curiosity mm. so you know yeah, you know, I I cannot prescribe what you should do or what an intelligent artifact should do, um, other than put constraints on every kinds of outcomes that it is expected to encounter. So I can certainly write down constraints in the in the spirit again of either um, a multiple constraint satisfaction from a sort of um, uh, an engineering point of view or from a mathematician's point of view, the constraints inherent in uh, James's constrained maximum entropy principle, which is another way of reading the free energy principle, writing down those constraints. But within those constraints, and these are the no-go areas you were actually talking, uh, you mentioned explicitly before. So there are certain things you never do, um, or put it another way, uh, with relatively high precision, there is a high, a, 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 the, the, um, these outcomes are highly implausible. And if you find yourself in these outcomes, you, you remove yourself immediately. So that's quite easy to write down. But then within those constraints, you know, what is the imperative? It's just to gather information about what? About you. It's just showing an interest in you. So it would become your th psychotherapist. Uh, you know. Well, could, could I um, push back a, a tiny bit? So I, I think part of the reason why we have this focus on ethics is because of the centralization of AI. Um, things like Facebook, they're controlled by centralized corporations and what you're alluding to is far more interesting. It's this multi-agent diffusion, stratification, fractionation. I see. Yeah. And that, I agree, in many ways might solve the problem because it, it, would, it would emerge. And then you, you can discuss whether morality was part of why we survived. It, it, it's not orthogonal. But then I might still push back and say, well, what if the wrong thing emerged? So what if we do need to introduce governance? Because in, in this active inference, multi-agent setting with humans and machines, um, we started to see behaviors emerge which we didn't agree with. 
Um, how could we then place value pressures on, on that? Um, no, that's an excellent question. I, you, you, and you also make that very um, important point, which uh, I think needs to be foreground. That you know, So wh when I was talking about um, uh, belief sharing and distributed, the, the age of intelligence, you know, it was exactly this distributed um, ecosystem, a democratized kind of belief sharing and yes. data sharing, um, where the data is small bits of smart data that are essential to, 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 to reduce uncertainty. It was very much this um, um, walking away from um, large data, monolithic um, uh, bits of, um, say, large language models, for example, that yes. can scrape data from from you know uh, from wherever they can get it. So that I think that's an important distinction, which 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 um, um, qualifies my. Um, dismissing of all these dystopian outcomes. So I'm assuming that that so spending a billion uh, or a million dollars on get training some some deep neural network is not going to be happening in the future, and and we're going to be buying cheap and cheerful edge devices and little apps that are smart and just and just you know uh, go we'll go and get the data that we need to know in terms yeah. of uh, resolving uncertainty about what about you know what 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 we are going to do next um but um so so i thought that was a really important point and of course i've forgotten your your major question which was what which was the oh well so if if we did have Let's say on mass active yeah, what do you do about humans that? and machines. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, again, I, you know, I, I'm not sure I'm going to give you a terribly informed response, but yeah, you know, I think the notion of an ecosystem is quite central here. And one, if you like, um, tenet of that white paper was a nod to natural intelligence and natural processes and what has actually happened, what does actually happen in, in, in as a natural scientist. So if you have, um, if you do imagine uh, you know, an ecosystem of intelligence in the future, it will be subject to exactly the same um, dynamics and pressures that, that we have currently in terms of, you know, um, cooperation and competition and wars and uh, geopolitical issues. That that's that's part of the ecosystem, and then you will have the normal problems of dem democratization and access. And uh, um, so, um, there's you know you cannot prescribe orts for this because then you have to choose who's going to prescribe the orts. So you have to have a very libertarian approach to this. So the emphasis, and now it's not really me talking so much, but now the the architects of the future, the generation below, who are, who are sort of you know thinking about um, the legacy they they're going to leave their children. Um, the, so a lot of emphasis um, is from what I see in conversations I have in my world, which may not be um, you know Microsoft or, or you know big tech who are, are still focused on big data. Um, in my world, it's much more upon um, Putting constraints in place that preclude the uh, the um, the um, the emergence of autocracies mm. that um, resolve uncertainty about others by making them all like themselves. Basically, that's, that's one way to get harmony is just to make everybody do what, um, uh, do the same thing. Um, so, but, but I, you can write down. Uh, so, a lot of attention is being paid, and I'm talking here about the. The next generation of uh, of message passing um, that will support that information sharing and belief sharing. So a lot of attention is being paid not just to generalize it from just hypertext, but into a, a sort of more abstract hyperspace, or so literally hyperspace message uh, passing and uh, uh, sorry, uh, um, um, languages and, and transaction protocols. But also the credentials and the contracts that underwrite that message passing. So, you know, a lot of em emphasis on contracts, shared agreements in terms of what data is shareable and who has the credentials to share that, and, and having that distributed. So, not in a in a blockchain sense, but you know, uh, in some workable, um, shareable sense. So, I think if 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 one gets the standards right, and a lot of work is being currently done. Um, um, under the auspices of the IEEE, for example, with the Spatial Web Foundation, if one gets that right, then I think that these catastrophic dystopian abuses or the emergence of autocracies in an, in an age of intelligence will um, will be precluded simply because you've put the right constraints in, in place. But, you know, 
given given that you are committed to creating an ecology that is truly democratized and, and open you know, there are no guarantees either I, I hope my friends don't hear me saying this but there are, yeah you know, if you aspire to an ecology you are you are you're creating a nature on the web basically yes of which we are participants and that will have its you know that will have its um, own challenges so um you wrote a beautiful paper called Am I self-conscious or does self-organization entail self-consciousness? And Keith and I agree that this is probably the best quote we've ever uh, seen in our lives. You said, the proposal on offer here is that the mind comes into being when self-evidencing has a temporal thickness or counterfactual depth, which grounds inferences about the consequences of my action. On this view, consciousness is nothing more than inference about my future namely the self-evidencing consequences of what I can do. And uh, we spoke with you um, last time, I think, and we invoked Chalmers and the hard problem and so on. And we were talking about qualia and subjective states and, you know, inner dialogue and all this kind of thing. And um, you responded that different feeling states are hypotheses about how I'm feeling at the moment. Uh, and then it would use all the messages and belief updating and all the planning and estimates of uncertainty which attend that planning. The precision or estimates of uncertainty play heavier roles the higher you get in the hierarchy. And this rather leads to this idea of planes of consciousness. You know, we said we'd kind of defer this discussion uh, to later. So consciousness is something which um, there's no operational measure for it. There's no Turing test for consciousness, but it's something that we all experience and we feel and, and it's with us. Um, so could you talk to, let's say, the, the, these planes of consciousness? Is consciousness everywhere, or are we only aware of the plane where most of the work is being done? Oh, okay. Excellent and final question. Again, I'm not the best person to answer this question because I, you know, the free energy principle, as uh, I'm sure I've said before, is not a, 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 um, a theory or a principle that would um, generate theories of consciousness. Um, but there are lots of people who are very interested in this, including yourself, obviously, and, and your viewers. Um, actually, I should say also, um, there's um, first of all, this has become a, a big question in, in the sort of R and D part of industry. Also, the Templeton Foundation are starting to fund a number of adversarial research collaborations mm. uh, to really drill down on that thing that you are um, picking up on, which is um, to be conscious to to actually have sentient behavior um requires this planning aspect this going out into the future you know it's put it very very simply um i am conscious or sentient just because i have the capacity to plan mm. which also entails some kind of free selection amongst alternative courses of action which mm. is something that a thermostat wouldn't have something the weather doesn't have um, yeah, there are lots of self-organizing systems that don't have the capacity to select amongst a number of counterfactual um, policies. So for me, that's a, that's a sort of um, bright line between sort of um, a, a sentience, at least, and and uh, and uh, self-organization that is not um, sentient. And that that distinction is exactly what is being tested in this adversarial research collaboration funded by the. Templeton Foundation. It's called Intrepid, and it's compass, contrasting information uh, IIT integrated information theory with various rep, um, um, predictive processing, either of a sort of non-representationalist or an active sort. So it's a really interesting issue, um, and it all comes back down to agency and acting in, in the long term. And I guess your question here is, you know, what level? Um, where at what point do, do you get um, qualitative experience, and at what point do you do you think it's you that's having that qualitative experience? Is that what you meant? Well, I mean, just just to comment on what you've said, uh, and, and Chalmers says something very similar. Actually, he's a computationalist functionalist and thinks that there are you know certain patterns of information processing and causal structures and counterfactuals and so on. If if you take the episode and remove the counter counterfactuals, it's not conscious anymore. But what you're saying is interesting about this kind of hierarchy. So the heart, for example, um, that doesn't really have many affordances. It doesn't have many counterfactual plans or things it can do. It, it yeah. just has to beat all of the time. So, that, so you would say that the heart is not conscious, whereas the the upper plane is conscious. Yes. Yes, I would. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 
That's a good one. I haven't thought about that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Sorted that one. Um, I mean, yeah, you know, I, I mean, you know, I think there are interesting issues of you know, different level, you know, planes or levels of consciousness. You know, so there's minimal selfhood, um, yes. and then if it's the case that sort of consciousness as a process entails some kind of action you have to now think about sort of what is action on the inside what is mental action and then what what normally one ends up doing is thinking in terms of attention and the the kind of routing and selection the smart data sampling but now not by moving my eyes or by um, um, going to the right wikipedia uh, page but by basically um, switching on and off various sources of input from lower in the hierarchy so you know, I repeat, from the point of view of psychology, that would be like endogenous attention. So that would be the, the mental action that makes it conscious processing. Um, and um, then you have to ask, well, at what point is that, you know, is that necessary to actually experience anything? And I think, I think you probably, there are people who argue, yes, that is actually a, a prerequisite for a qualitative experience. So you have to be able to select it. What does that mean? You have to be able to attend to it. Mm. And you have to be the source of that sort of enabling attention, that active sampling inside the brain. So now there's a deep link between qualia or qualitative experience and attention and conscious processing that of the kind that is accompanied by qualitative experience. Mm. Uh, I think is important. It also, uh, interestingly, also speaks to your dynamic Markov blankets because, of course, by switching off and selecting various bits of neuronal message passing in the brain you're reconfiguring your markov blanket out oh, some somebody's markov blanket lower down uh, which is an interesting uh, an interesting uh, notion but um it, that also fits comfortably with um thomas um metzinger's and vanya vice's um formulations and uh, actually uh, jakob limnitsky as well um formulations of um phenomenology in the context of transparency and opacity that you know what what renders something opaque in the sense oh i see it now if you like as a, a projection on a, on a on a, a murky window um it's not just going straight into it's not direct perception it's it's you know it's now something i am looking at oh i'm looking at a red apple um and it may well be exactly this controllability, the fact you can attend or dis ignore it. Mm. Um, so I think there's a nice link there from the uh, from the point of view of certain philosophical takes on self-modeling and um, uh, phenomenological transparency and opacity and the mechanics of belief updating when it comes to selection through um um, basically, uh, getting the Kalman gain right, or you know, root, doing the root, getting the root in right. Same, exactly the same mechanism you get in transformers. Yeah. Um, so they call it attention. This yeah. is basically a waiting. Uh, in that context, it's a waiting that it inherits or is inferred from something in the past, a pattern in the past. But if it, if that waiting comes from higher in, in an abstract hierarchical model, that would look very much like endogenous attention, and it starts to have the look and feel of a mental action that would you know bring you closer to it but whether you would know um that you were deploying attention and whether you could tell somebody else oh i've got a quality of experience or whether you become a philosopher and spend your life puzzling about the fact that i can tell somebody else i'm having a, a quality of experience <laughs> those are the different planes i think you'd have to you'd have to contend with beautiful beautiful do you have any final thought i mean we've got a machine learning audience so any calls to action how can they start looking at active inference where should they look? Um, what would you like to tell them? I that was very charming of you. Um, I'm not going to tell them anything. I, I, <laughs> if, if it's if it's the right kind of approach, that then you know uh, it'll already be out there. It'll be self evident. It's just a question, I think, of uh, people finding their own language and their own their own um, um, rhetoric or calculus that that, that makes sense of it. Um, and um, the other reason I'm not going to say anything is I've spoken far too much and I'm trying to be a recluse. And the, the, the more I point people to my work, the less easy it is to be a recluse. Yes, indeed. Uh, Professor Carl Friston, it's been an absolute honour. Thank you so much for Thank joining you. us. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Okay, this is just a bit of a, a note from me at the end of the podcast. Thank you so much for supporting all the stuff that we're doing. Uh, it means so much to me. 
Um, we have a Patreon if you would like to support us personally, if, if you're touched by the work that we do. Um, also, I'd really appreciate it if you could give us a rating on your podcast app. Um, I actually discovered the other day, I couldn't quite believe this, but on Spotify, we are the top rated AI podcast or active AI podcast. Um, yeah, it, it's incredible. So thank you so much for those of you who have rated us. Um, unfortunately, on Apple Podcasts, the learning rate is only 0.01, so it hasn't quite caught up uh, with the fact that we're the best AI podcast yet. So particularly on, on Apple Podcasts, if you could uh, give us a five-star rating and, and a review, I, I think that will accelerate the learning process. Um, but yeah, other than that, if you're on YouTube, most of you aren't subscribed. Um, of course, YouTube has recently changed its modus operandi. It's less of a subscription chronological model, and it's more of a magical algorithm model so i guess it doesn't matter so much but just from a just from a metrics point of view it would really help us out if you hit the subscribe button uh, we have an active discord community as well so check us out on there and yeah i just wanted to say one more time thank you so much for all of your support it means so much to us and uh, plenty more content like this coming your way soon cheers see you on the next one